Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto was sealed inside Mortal Kombat. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Silver's Gilded Style and link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. Raiden's plight, boy Naruto. Here's an apple, free of charge. Exclaimed a merchant as he threw one of his apples to the fourth shinobi war hero. Naruto effortlessly caught the apple as he walked past the merchant further down the road. After giving his thanks, Naruto recounted just how different his life turned out for the better. About three years prior, Naruto had participated in the fourth shinobi war and was praised as the hero of the war. After defeating Abito, who later had a change of heart, he would go on to battle Madara. Surprisingly, Madara would be betrayed by Black Zetsu who was an agent of Kagaya all along. But Sasuke, Sakura, and Kakashi, Naruto would put an end to Kagaya by sealing her off and putting an end to the war. Hagoromo would then wash away Sasuke and Naruto's respective sealing marks and soon disappear. One of the biggest highlights for Naruto personally was finally being able to meet his father. While it was only during the war and conversations were brief, it meant the world to the orphan ninja. He also received the other half of Kurama from his father before he passed on again, which symbolized his dad's final parting gift. Soon after the war, Sasuke challenged him to a deadly fight which he narrowly won. Of course, he rationalized he could have won much quicker if he hadn't been exhausted from fighting in a war, but a win is a win. He nearly lost his arm as well, however, he had just enough time to coat his arm with Kurama's chakra while exchanging the final blow with Sasuke. He thanked himself as well for that because he knew he definitely would have lost his arm in the battle. As for his friends, nothing much has changed except for everyone being in a relationship. After the war, Shikamaru formed a romantic relationship with Tamari, and they are still going strong. Choji began dating Kari from the Hidden Cloud Village, and they are doing wonderful. Ino also started a relationship with Sai, and it was going amazing for them. Sakura was finally able to date and marry the boy she had chased as a young girl. She and Sasuke were a good couple if you didn't count Sasuke occasionally leaving the village. Naruto was actually the best man during the wedding, and he couldn't have been more proud. While he did harbor feelings for Sakura when he was younger, it was more of a schoolboy crush and not romantic love. He had broken out of his infatuation with her many years ago. As for Hinata, he was slightly disappointed with how their relationship changed over time. At first, after the war, they both went on a few dates. Hinata's confession while fighting pain was what pushed Naruto to try his hardest. However, while the dates were fun, there was no genuine spark, at least on Naruto's end. Instead of entering a loveless relationship, they both decided to break it off as good friends. He's even heard rumors that Hinata is starting to see Kiba in a romantic light, which is great for them if it is true. Overall, many of Naruto's friends were beginning to form serious romantic relationships. It sometimes bothered Naruto's mind if he thought about it too hard, but he tried to not let it bother him. He was also proud that his former sensei, Kakashi, became the sixth Hokage after Tsunade. These great achievements for the people around him made Naruto feel lost in life. His dream, goal, and lifelong mission of becoming Hokage didn't appeal to him anymore. It sounded crazy even to him that the dream he'd strived for since a child didn't seem like the career he wanted anymore. He still remembers the shocked reactions of Tsunade and Kakashi when he told both of them respectively. He even told his friends when they all sat at a restaurant for a friendly gathering. Sakura began running a medical examination over him while Rock Lee began crying over losing his flames of youth. It was a funny experience that turned into a fond memory. The path to Hokage seemed almost constrictive to Naruto. As he matured, he realized that being Hokage isn't always the most exciting position. Battling enemies, throwing around destructive jutsus, and saving others is what he enjoyed most. The feeling of being free and roaming when possible is what truly sparked Naruto's interest after the war. He didn't want to sit behind a desk filing paperwork all day when he could be out and doing something else. Now, while he may not want to become Hokage, he didn't allow himself to slack off. These past three years have been filled with excitement for the young ninja. Once the war ended, he would bury his nose in the library because he wanted to better his battle strategies and tactics. His dumb luck of charging in headfirst without a plan would not cut it out in future encounters, and the war proved that. There were many instances he was outsmarted simply because his battle intelligence was lacking in certain regards. Having clones who could also read simultaneously helped tremendously. Naruto read all sorts of novels regarding war, politics, and strategy. It was thanks to his late teacher, Jiraiya, that Naruto had any interest in politics at all. He learned so much under the former sage that he wished he had more time to just speak with the man. Jiraiya always reminded Naruto that no information is useless if you know how to use it. Besides catching up on years' worth of reading in months, Naruto also worked out his arsenal of jutsus. It was almost embarrassing how often he relied on the shadow clone and Rasengan technique in his opinion. 
his main affinity, Wind, was worked on relentlessly in the Kanoha training grounds. During the war, he had access to all affinities, thanks to Six Path Sage mode, which was later taken away by Hagoromo. Now while he may not have access to this mode anymore, the ability to use all the affinities was still there although to a lesser extent. While he practiced using Jutsus in all affinities, his main arsenal revolved around Wine Jutsus. He also improved his Kawarimi technique, so it needed much less time to substitute with nearby objects or people. His Sage mode also required less time to enter, and he did not need any clones beforehand to access it. Even basic training, such as water walking, tree climbing, and other exercises, helped him control his chakra. Before, Naruto poured too much chakra into techniques simply because he lacked chakra control. Over the years, it has improved tremendously to the point he doesn't overly waste chakra on his techniques. Gunai, shuriken, and even senbon throwing were practiced to help with his projectile accuracy. He could now hit a target much more accurately, even while moving at high speeds. Now of course all of this training and improvement wouldn't mean much if it wasn't put to use, so Naruto made sure to keep his skills sharp. Kakashi would regularly give him high A to S rank missions because he could handle them while also practicing new techniques in battle. A side effect of this was now, for the first time in his life, Naruto had more money than he knew what to do with. He didn't spend much on rent, didn't overly spend from his money-saving habits as a child, and didn't flaunt his newfound wealth either. Perhaps one of the biggest achievements Naruto achieved was learning how to use the Horation. After getting approval from Kakashi, Naruto was allowed to look into the Hokage's scroll of seals that he stole momentarily as a kid. The reason for this was to look into Tabarama's version of the Horation, as well as his father's notes on the technique. This allowed him to gain a basic understanding of the technique which he would eventually learn. This was possible because part of his reading within the village library was learning Fuinjutsu which came naturally to Naruto, probably thanks to his Uzumaki genes. While not a complete master in the field, he does have a great understanding of the subject and has worked on his own personal seals. To help strengthen himself, Naruto has placed his own personal seals located around his body. These are simply seals that increase the gravity on his body to increase his speed, as well as chakra suppression seals, to allow himself more room to grow. Having three years to simply practice and better yourself in battle had done wonders for Naruto. From improving his Karama cloak duration to having sharper reaction times, he had improved by leaps and bounds. The addition of clones only sped up his progress as a warrior. Even Kakashi believed Naruto had surpassed him, even if he used his Sharingan. These thoughts all coursed through Naruto as he came back to reality and realized he was in front of his apartment once more. Sighing from once again returning to an empty apartment, Naruto took a bite of his free apple and checked for his keys. Releasing another sigh, Naruto realized he left his keys at the training grounds he came from. Despite his improvements in the last three years, it seemed some things would never change. In the Jinsei chamber within Earthrealm, there was a soft hum and a faint blue glow within the Jinsei chamber. This was Earthrealm's life force and the energy that Raiden guarded with his life. The magical warrior could not afford anybody to get their hands on the energy, especially after the battle with Shinnok two decades before. After the battle against the fallen elder god, Raiden vowed to take better care of the Jinsei. After all, what good is a protector if they cannot safeguard the one thing that matters most to the realm? Raiden awoke with a gasp of surprise as he looked around his surroundings. He calmed himself and slowed his breath when he realized nothing was out of the ordinary. He was meditating in the Jinsei chamber when he suddenly felt this overwhelming feeling that something was wrong. This feeling of overwhelming trepidation was one not born out of fear, but instead born out of instinct. By the elder gods, something is amiss, exclaimed Raiden. He felt deep in his core that something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong. This was not something he could brush off, especially since he received this feeling while meditating in the Jinsei chamber, the place he should theoretically feel most at peace. Now normally, Raiden may ignore these feelings of negativity as simple coincidence. However, after the slaughter of both Kung Lao and Liu Kang, due to his incorrect assumptions of his future visions, he takes these feelings much more seriously with careful examination. Raiden could not afford to cause the deaths of Earthrealm's mightiest warriors due to his mistakes any longer, a guilt he still harbors to this day. This guilt still eats away at Raiden's spirit, but he forces himself to move forward for Earthrealm's benefit. Even as Raiden focused in on this feeling he was receiving, he still could not understand what was occurring. He didn't know what his soul was telling him, but he knew trouble when he felt it. However, Raiden did hate the uncertainty of what was going on. The bad premonition he was receiving could be a multitude of things, but he just couldn't narrow it down to what it was. He just knew that something horrible was happening that needed to be acted upon now before it would become too late. The last time I felt this way, I had visions of a future where Shao Kahn annihilated everyone. The next, Shinnok began his assault on our planet. 
These feelings are not paranoia, they are a warning of a dark future ahead, contemplated Raiden as he scrunched his eyebrows in frustration, however, I have no idea what it is warning me about this time. After a few more moments passed, Raiden gathered his thoughts and made his decision. I must inform the others that there is treachery of some kind afoot. I only hope it does not threaten Earthrealm, with his thoughts intact, Raiden teleported himself to his allies within the special forces base. Okay troops, line up. This is a mandatory roll call. When I say your name, respond accordingly. Make this difficult and I will make you all run until someone throws up. Do I make myself clear? Shouted Sonya Blade, the legendary female warrior. Yes ma'am. Responded the platoon. Just as the roll call was about to be underway, it was disrupted by a crackle of lighting. Looking over to her left, Sonya saw the trusted protector of Earthrealm begin walking towards her. Welcome Raiden, it's nice to see you again, stated Sonya. Likewise Ms. Blade, however, I am afraid this is not a social visit. I bring news that is pivotal to your ears, said Raiden with a serious expression. Noticing how this would require her full attention, Sonya handed off the clipboard she was holding to another ranked officer, whispered a few words into their ear, and walked off with Raiden toward a secure location. So, mind telling me what's going on to have you riled up? Asked Sonya. Of course, however, it is critical that we have everybody present before I begin my explanation, responded Raiden. With a sigh and a nod, Sonya knew what that meant. Her ex-husband, Johnny Cage, would be joining the both of them soon. Now, Sonya didn't hate her ex-husband or anything, but she sure wished she didn't have to deal with him while on duty. He always seemed to have the energy to make sure her buttons were pushed. As both Raiden and Sonya were walking, they managed to see the individual both were looking for. Johnny Cage, formerly a Hollywood actor, came into view from down the military base. He was walking towards both fighters with a large smile on his face and a spring in his step. Welcome Raiden to the best military operations on the planet. I love seeing you again, but I'm not gonna lie, I am hurt you would choose Sonya over me, pouted Johnny Cage. Raiden responded with a small smile. Do not worry Johnny Cage, I meant no harm to your ego. Sonya and I were actually looking for you, but you saved us the trouble. A small smile on Raiden's face eventually turned into a firm frown. However, I would like to discuss with you and Sonya some concerns I have been afflicted with. Join us so we may begin discussing solutions. Seeing how Raiden and Sonya were both serious, Johnny Cage got the hint and dropped his comedic act. While he loved to be the class clown so to speak, he was also a warrior who understood when to be serious. He didn't get this far in life by acting naive and childish, even though it did get him through a large majority of it. Seeing how Sonya took the lead, both he and Raiden followed suit and walked into a nearby building. After clearing out those inside on Sonya's orders, each occupant stood around a large table in the middle of the room. With everything being settled, Raiden began to speak. I have come here today because I have a foreboding feeling that there is deceit being conducted. I would normally not raise concerns on vague premonitions, but after what happened to both of my former students, I do not take these lightly anymore. Understanding who Raiden was referring to, both Sonya and Johnny took in what Raiden had said. Something was going on and it was serious enough that it had caused concern for the lighting combatant. Sonya was the first to respond, okay I understand where you're coming from, but I don't think we can disrupt the operations here on our base to simply investigate these premonitions. I don't mean to offend, but where would we even start looking to help settle this? It is simple Sonya Blade, I will not ask you to do anything of the sort, said Raiden. This statement earned a confused look from both Johnny and Sonya. Okay so then nothing is going to happen? Asked a confused Johnny Cage. I did not say that either Johnny Cage. Instead, I have a plan to help counteract these feelings while not interrupting your personal lives, Raiden then paused his speech to wave his hands, and a diagram erupted. It showed many different portals and planets, however, there were only a few main highlighted ones. As you can see here, there are many realms in existence. Earthrealm Raiden then pointed at the planet in the middle of his diagram, is where we currently reside. However, there are many other realms that you are both familiar with. Outworld, the Netherum, and Edenia are just a few of the many realms out there. There are also realms such as Chaosrum and Orderum that exist as well. There are even more realms than the ones I mentioned, but I have a reason for all of this. Raiden then waves his arms once more, and the entirety of the hologram disappears. Sonya and Johnny Cage did not expect a history lesson, but they weren't complaining either. They were more surprised by the amount of worlds out there that have probably never been explored before. I realize that we are not as well defended as I'd like. While I appreciate the efforts of your special forces and the allies we have now, I feel as though it is not enough. This unsettles me because as Earthrealm's protector, I cannot afford to ignore these premonitions that can endanger our world. Raiden stated with conviction in his voice. I think you are overthinking this entire situation Raiden, said Johnny Cage. We have great defenses here on Earthrealm. Besides you, me, and Sonya, we have so many other defenders. 
We have Jax, Kenshi, Scorpion, and Sub-Zero, plus my daughter and her team. I think we have things locked down pretty well here in Earthrealm. Besides everyone I mentioned, we also have the Shaolin monks that are trained to kick ass when needed. I think we're fine, to be honest with you. You would be correct Johnny Cage, however, ponder my words. Can we rely on a handful of defenders to be Earthrealm's last line of defense, should it needed? Asked Raiden. We also have to worry about the warriors turned evil such as Sindel, Jade, Cable, Katana, Liu Kang, and Kung Lao among others. This is not including Quan Kai in the mix and whatever diabolical plan he may form. Seeing his point of view a little more, Johnny Cage kept his mouth shut and thought about how to respond. As for the Shaolin monks, I sense slight resentment from them. I do not blame them however, I was responsible for two of their prized students being murdered. I do not think they will fail us in our time of need, but I have witnessed betrayal occur for far less. Raiden then placed both of his hands on the table. I am not here to disrupt your daily operations, please do not misread my actions. Instead, I am here to explain myself and where I will be going. Wait hold on, where you'll be going. What exactly does that mean Raiden? Responded Sonya. As Earthrealm's protector, it is my duty to ensure we are safe from all threats. With that being said, I do not feel we currently fill those requirements. The reason I showed you both a near infinite amount of realms is to express that I will be traveling to these realms in search of additional warriors to help our cause. I aim to bring back as many warriors as possible without delay. I do not plan to be gone for long as I still have my duty as our realm's protector. Are you sure you won't be lost on your way back? How do you know you won't stay trapped in another realm? Asked Sonya. Do not fret Sonya Blade, I have that covered. I was meditating in the Jinsei chamber before I came here. I made sure to attach my being with the energy coded within the chamber, so I have my waypoint back home at all times. Expressed Raiden as he began to straighten himself out. So then, when do you plan to leave? Asked Johnny Cage as he closed his eyes. I will take my leave immediately, it is imperative I bring back formidable warriors as soon as possible instead of delaying. I hope when I return, we have the insurance needed should Earthrealm be threatened, said Raiden, as his energy began to flow within himself in preparation to leave. Do you have an idea of where you'll go first? Possibly one of the main realms you mentioned. Pondered Johnny Cage. Negative Johnny Cage, instead of going to the nearby realms, I wish to explore farther out scenarios. I do not believe there are any allies we can make in those realms due to previous experiences. Instead, we need fighters who are unbiased in their relation to the other realms. With that said, I must take my leave. Protect Earthrealm in my absence and I will return soon. In a flash of light, Raiden was gone and out of sight. So I know this is kind of an awkward time to ask, but do you think you can send me the file of the upcoming mission you want me to send Cassie on again? I may have lost the paperwork regarding it. Ask a sheepish Johnny Cage. Sonya simply sighed and shook her head as she walked out of the building. She was thinking about going to the nearby pharmacy and getting some medication for the headache that was starting to form. She would definitely need it if she was planning on staying around Johnny for longer than 10 minutes. But in Kanahagakur, Naruto was stretching as he finished warming up for his upcoming sparring session. He originally had an A-rank mission planned for the day, but Kakashi informed him the client lied about the threat level, and it was accurately changed to a C-rank mission. Unfortunately, there was no A or S rank mission to give out instead, so Naruto took his time to the training grounds on the outskirts of the village. It didn't bother him to not have a mission for the day, it happened on rare occasions. Just as he was about to charge up a wind jutsu to test its effectiveness, he paused when he sensed an incoming presence. Now, while Raiden was optimistic about his search at first, he was slowly losing his patience. Realm after realm was different but hopeless for his journey. The first realm he appeared in had no life whatsoever, the second had prehistoric life, and the third inhabited a special species of flying birds that had no conscious thought. This would be the same pattern for so many realms that Raiden lost count. He had nearly given up hope when he appeared in front of a blonde-haired ninja. Surprised at the immediate encounter, Raiden was speechless. He had finally found life, and it seemed he would have his first ally to Earthrealm. So imagine to his surprise he was only able to take one step before he could not move. Sorry to restrain you, but I don't know who you are or where you came from, so I took a quick precaution. I have seals all over my training grounds to increase the gravity I train at, and I decided to redirect a majority of them towards you, so I could gauge your intention said Naruto. Now normally this would be a rare idea for the knucklehead ninja of the past. However, he was not that naive child or inexperienced teenager anymore, he was a grown adult who had seen war. The only reason he didn't take lethal force to begin with was because the man in front of him was dressed in no typical clothing found across the elemental nations. Furthermore, thanks to Kurama, Naruto was able to sense emotions on a small scale and could tell this individual meant him no harm. This emotion sensing ability only worked within a small range, but it was effective in this instance. 
interesting, he was able to detect me quick enough to respond, ensure my captivity, and restrain me all within a matter of a few seconds. His ability to formulate an effective plan in a moment and execute it flawlessly is phenomenal. He has a very impressive and sharp mind for one who looks as young as he does. Pondered Raiden. Greetings, I am Raiden, God of Thunder, and I am traveling the realms in search of valiant warriors. There was a few seconds of silence before a response was heard. Right sorry if I'm skeptical, but can you prove this? Responded Naruto with a raised eyebrow. Raiden simply made his eyes glow with electricity and formed a ball of lighting within his palms. While he could not move, it did not mean he couldn't form his own energy. Now these actions alone made Naruto's brain do a quick reboot. It was not every day you heard somebody claim their god and actually back it up. Interesting, it's almost like they're not using chakra at all. In fact, I don't sense any chakra resonating from him at all, even after his display of power can his claims about being a god from another realm be true. Thought Naruto with bewilderment. I would advise you to be open-minded about this situation Naruto, spoke Kurama from within his mindscape and with one eye open from his slumber. The presence of this stranger garnered his immediate attention. Do not forget you battled Kagaya in different dimensions, who knows what else lay beyond the time and space we are familiar with. You're right Kurama, it's just so bizarre that it occurred now of all times. It's hard to think there is other life beyond what we know, but it's also exciting to think of the adventures possible as well, spoke back Naruto. It is also concerning that this man's presence alone threatened Kurama enough to wake up from his slumber. After many moments of silence and digesting that appearance of one another, a question rang out. So then, how can I help you? Asked Naruto. I search for those experienced in combat to help protect the realm I cherish from harm. In return, I promise to grant anything that is reasonable and within my power, replied Raiden, still immobile. This almost seemed like a moment that was too good to be true. While on the outside, Naruto was calm and collected, he was joyous on the inside. This felt like the opportunity of a lifetime, the possibility to help others when they needed it. Call him an idiot, but even war couldn't break the Uzumaki's want of helping others. He was even able to reform Gara, the same person who crushed people to death in sand coffins. I see, are there any warriors from my realm you have in mind to help you? Asked Naruto, using air quotations around the word realm, as he still had a hard time digesting the vocabulary. I do, I see him before my eyes, said Raiden with a smile. And how do you know you can trust me? I like to believe I can read people well, call it my intuition. I have seen many great warriors express themselves through combat, appearance, and even words. But I can tell you have a leader's aura given your actions, exclaimed Raiden. My actions? I could have killed you, you know. Responded Naruto, slightly annoyed that his childhood verbal tick came out at the worst time. Yes, you could have, but you didn't, said Raiden. After a few more moments of silence, the seals faded away and Raiden could move once more. After stretching his limbs and rotating his wrists, Raiden seemed to be back to normal. What a guy, those gravity seals were 10x the normal gravity of my planet and he just needed a quick stretch to work out the kinks. Even if he's not some deity, he's definitely strong, thought Naruto with careful eyes. It's also making me wonder if he could have broken out of those seals at any time. Well, let's continue this conversation with the Hokage who is the leader of my village. Even if I accept your invitation to help, which I still haven't, I need to discuss this with him regardless, spoke Naruto. Of course, I would not wish to offend or uproot you from your home without explanation. Let us meet your leader and I will be happy to share what I have told you. Please, lead the way. Said Raiden with an arm wave. After looking over the newcomer one final time, Naruto looked over his shoulder and gave a friendly smile. Try to keep up, I don't want to leave you behind. With that said, he began dashing to the Hokage Tower with Raiden in tow. Evening the odds, so let me get this straight, you are a deity of another world, Kakashi then pointed at Raiden, and you wish to take Naruto, he then looked towards the most unpredictable ninja he knew, on a journey to help protect your realm. Is that right? Raiden nodded his head, yes, those are my intentions. Kakashi digested everything that occurred in the last 15 minutes. It was another day for the sixth Okage when Naruto barged in and a person in unique attire followed suit. It was a sudden intrusion, but once he saw the serious expression on both individuals, Kakashi sent his Anbu out of his office to ensure privacy. Once some seals were placed by Naruto to ensure nobody outside could hear their conversation, the explanations began. Naruto then explained everything he was told with Raiden corroborating his story. He would have been more surprised if he did not personally have experience with other dimensions already. His time fighting Abito in another dimension as well as Kagaya opened his mind to the thought of other worlds long ago. Well, Naruto is my highest rank shinobi under my command and is probably one of the strongest beings on our planet, to be honest with you. However, why should I allow him to leave our village? What incentive gives me that option? Asked Kakashi. As much as he hated to think of Naruto as a tool, he needed to see this situation from the viewpoint of a Hokage. 
the safety of the village was his priority after all. Having their strongest fighter leave for an undefined amount of time could hurt their defenses. That is very true Lord Hokage, exclaimed Raiden, however, I have promised Naruto to grant him anything that is reasonable and within my power. If you'd like, I am willing to extend this offer to you, however, I must warn you that is the extent I am willing to go. I cannot easily make these promises to others so freely. Bakashi pondered Raiden's words and stayed silent for a few moments. After a few more seconds of silence, Kakashi turned towards Naruto. Then let me ask you this Naruto, how do you feel about this? Naruto took a deep breath and gathered what he wanted to say. Well Kakashi-sensei, I truly sense that Raiden feels his world is in danger from some unknown threat. If possible, I would want to join his cause and protect others. Even if they are strangers with no relation to us, I have never been able to stand aside if I could willingly help those in need. Naruto then began to reminisce on events that had taken place in his lifetime. He continued with his speech, Nagato, Tsunade, Niji, and even Zabuza were all people that I didn't need to care for. In the end, though, I was able to help change them. I've realized that helping others is a passion that I have always cherished, and no amount of time can take that away from me. So, if allowed, I would like to help Raiden with his world, Kakashi-sensei. After a few moments of information digestion, Naruto continued. Plus, our world seems to be at peace. Sure, some conflicts might pop up here and there, but we are truly much closer to peace than we have been in a long time. I would love to give Raiden's world the same luxury we have. My friends have moved on into serious relationships which comes with age, but I don't fall into that category. I may be wanted here, but I almost feel like I am not needed here. If I can still use my skills to help those in need, then I would do it in a heartbeat. Seeing how his former student was finished, Kakashi smiled. He assumed Naruto would wish to help, he just always had those characteristics. No amount of bloodshed, gore, violence, or hate could break Naruto's spirit. It was one of the things that Kakashi truly admired about the blonde-haired shinobi. Awaiting Kakashi's decision, both Naruto and Raiden peeled their ears when he began to speak. I always knew you were destined for great things Naruto, but I never would have expected you to be a savior to a different world, Kakashi chuckled. Many more seconds passed before he began to speak again. I think you should go help Raiden, it's always been in your nature to help. I can give you a modified version of traveling rights, so you can always return when needed and not be labeled as a missing ninja. Not like we could do much if you did decide to leave willingly, laughed Kakashi within his mind. Seeing his agreement, Naruto let out a breath he didn't know he was holding. After thanking Kakashi, Raiden then shared his thanks as well. He was grateful this new world was reasonable in granting them one of their strongest warriors. As for your Raiden, Kakashi began, I do not require a fear wish from you, I am doing this out of my own volition. I owe it to Naruto, as much as I hate to admit it, I was not there much for him as a child. His father, my sensei, instilled many values that I still hold dear. I repaid his kindness by overlooking his only child for too long. One of my biggest regrets was not helping him more to develop into the person he is today. Bakashi sensei, thought Naruto in surprise. He never knew his former teacher felt this way about him. I just ask, when do you plan to depart? Asked Kakashi. If possible, within the day. I cannot be gone for long as I am my realm sworn protector, answered Raiden. I understand. Well then, if everything is settled, I think Naruto has to go pack his belongings and say goodbye to his friends until he returns. Naruto, you are dismissed but return to the Hokage office once you're ready. As for you Raiden, if you could please remain behind, I would like to have a few more words. Naruto nodded and used the Shunshin no Jutsu to travel to his apartment. With a small gust of wind, Naruto disappeared and prepared to take everything he would need for his unknown journey. Thank goodness he could seal a lot more things with his newfound knowledge in Fuenjutsu. What is it you wish to discuss Lord Hokage? Asked Raiden in respect. I just wanted to have you make me one promise before you and Naruto both leave, replied Kakashi in a serious voice. And what is that? Asked a cautious Raiden. Kakashi then did something that truly shocked the electric fighter, he stood up and bowed. Please, protect Naruto with all your power. He is strong, maybe even stronger than anyone I know, but he is precious to me. I have failed him and he still turned out a great shinobi, but he is vulnerable just as anybody else. Take care of him while you are away and ensure to me his safety will be your priority, exclaimed Kakashi. Seeing how the promise was not that of power, but of protection, Raiden dropped his cautious stance. He now understood just how deeply the village leader cared about the warrior in orange. He wondered what kind of person Naruto was to earn such a deep loyalty from the man behind the mask. I, Raiden, protector of Earthrealm, vow to keep Naruto safe to the best of my ability. I shall cause him no deliberate harm and will guide him when needed, promised Raiden with his right arm raised and slightly bowing. Seeing how it was good enough for him, Kakashi stood straight, nodded, and smiled. Now, they both awaited the return of the hero of Konoha. Many hours later, gathering his belongings came easy to Naruto. 
after all, he has had to prepare for missions last minute and still fluently packaged his necessities. It wasn't the packing that was hard for the shinobi, rather, it was saying bye to his friends. Growing up without a family led Naruto to attach strong bonds to those he deemed close to him. Jiraiya became a father figure to him, while Tsunade was the mother he never had. He saw Sasuke as a brother and even viewed his friends as his precious people. Some may call his relationships with friends as overbearing, but Naruto truly values his friends. He believed if he did not have those around him when he did, he may have turned out like Gara as a child. Being pulled away from the darkness of loneliness is only possible with people at your side. In his opinion, Naruto owed many thanks to his friends for taking away the curse of emptiness he used to feel daily. It was relatively easy to track down many of his friends and say goodbye. Rock Lee, Tenten, Shino, Kiba, Choji, Shikamaru, Ino, Sakura, Hinata and Tsunade all received an explanation of why he would be gone for a while. He told each individual he may be gone for a long time as he would be on a mission away from the village that was approved by Kakashi. If a friend would push for more details, Naruto would just smile and say it was confidential, but that he would always cherish their friendship. Most of Naruto's friends were confused by the blonde's cryptic message, but they accepted it nonetheless. What they didn't realize was that Naruto was treating this as possibly the last time he would see them because deep down inside, Naruto understood the risk he could die while in Raiden's realm. Sakura and Hinata were the two interactions that he felt were the toughest for him. Sakura almost cried at Naruto's verbiage. To her, it sounded like the blonde was accepting the fact he could be killed on this long-term mission. The thought scared her as she didn't think there were many things out there that could kill him, but she just supported her former teammate on his journey. As for Hinata, their interaction ended with a close hug and silence. Hinata always believed in Naruto, and it still rang true for her. If the blonde was to be sent away on a confidential mission approved by Kakashi, she would trust in both of their judgments. She gave the orange-loving ninja a hug goodbye and expressed her thanks for everything he did for her. Naruto almost released tears when they departed from each other. Emotion sensing was both a blessing and a curse for the war hero. Finally, it came down to Sasuke. He expected to find him within the home he shared with Sakura, but after a quick explanation from the pink-haired Kinoichi, he found out Sasuke was returning soon from a mission. After waiting at the village gates for the Sharingan wearer to appear, his patience was answered. So what makes you want to wait at the village's entrance for me, Naruto? Asked Sasuke with a raised eyebrow as he was walking into Konoha. After a few more moments of walking, both shinobi stood across from each other. Once his explanation of his departure was finished, Naruto awaited a response. Thankfully, Sasuke gave one back. So you're leaving for a while, huh? Mumbled Sasuke with closed eyes. He stayed that way for about a minute and let the rustling wind fill the silence. You know Daob, you may be able to fool the others, but I can tell mission means more to you than you're letting on. I also get the feeling you're not sure if you return, which worries me since I should be the only one capable of challenging you, smirked Sasuke. Naruto also gave a smile at his old rival's words. But, if this is something you hold dear, then I will await your return. Just promise me when you come back, we'll have another spar. I still haven't beaten you, and that needs to change if you ask me, spoke Sasuke. After giving his own nod, Naruto held out his fist. Understanding what the blonde-haired ninja's intentions were, Sasuke held up his fist for a small fist bump. With that being over, Naruto turned around and began walking away. As he began to get out of his view, Sasuke looked towards the person who pulled him out of the darkness that consumed the majority of his life. Once he could no longer see the war hero, he let out a smile he would never let anyone see him with and began walking home. He knew Naruto would shake up anywhere he would go, and he didn't expect any less out of his rival. In the Hokage Tower, Raiden and Kakashi were both having a pleasant conversation about each other's worlds. Raiden spoke about how many realms there were and how each realm was broken down into. Kakashi thought this Shao Kahn from the past was an undeserving ruler. While Raiden did not go into much detail about him, the snippets he did tell him were definitely unpleasant. As for Raiden, he learned much about the shinobi world. The different nations, each consisting of a different cage, were fascinating to him. The food here reminded Raiden of the Asian dishes of Earthrealm which was interesting to him. As the conversation was underway, both beings turned to the window that housed a crouching Naruto. After slipping inside the room, Naruto stood up and they took in his appearance. The once iconic orange clothing worn by the unpredictable ninja was completely changed. The importance of stealth had grown on Naruto, so he wanted to make sure the last thing to give him away would be clothes. His hair, which was once spiky, had smoothed down over the years and now reached just above his blue eyes. His face had lost a lot of baby fat in the war, and he had a much more pronounced jawline and visible muscles under his clothing. Naruto was not overly muscular and was much more akin to a swimmer's physique, but he held amazing power regardless. His whisker mark still remained on his face, but he learned long ago to accept them. As for his wardrobe, it changed dramatically after the war. 
Naruto changed out his sandals for steel-toed black combat boots. His legs were covered by black pants that reached all the way down to his ankles. His upper body was coated in a dark gray, long-sleeved shirt. He had a small yin-yang necklace hanging over his shirt, but he was known to tuck it underneath if he needed to. He had made the purchase one day when he looked into a vendor's store and it stuck out to him. He also wore black fingerless gloves on each hand that were a present from Tsunade a few birthdays back. Even though they were years old, he still kept them in great condition, and they seemed new. Over his dark gray shirt, he wore a dark brown leather crop jacket. This was the only piece of clothing that had orange, which was coated along the inside of the jacket. It was personally made for him by a merchant whose family he had brought back after Payne's attack. He had to admit, it was stylish and he liked wearing it, it also zipped up if he needed to, but he kept it unzipped a majority of the time. Finally, depending on the mission, Naruto brought a Kakashi-style mask with him, in case he needed to hide his face. It would cover everything to the point only his eyes were visible. He tucked it away on the inside of his leather jacket. He also had the traditional kunai and weapon pouches, both black, on his hip and leg. With all the clothing he wore, nobody could guess the amount of seals he placed on his person. They were in for a surprise if they managed to push him far enough in battle. Naruto began to speak, so Kakashi-sensei, before we leave, I wanted to ask if you needed my headband back. Kakashi shook his head and gave out a small chuckle. Unless you plan on abandoning us, you may keep it Naruto. You've earned it more than any other ninja, so wear it with pride for as long as you want. Giving a smile and nod in return, Naruto kept his Konoha headband fastened around his forehead. It would sometimes be obscured if his hair fell over it, but it wasn't too much of a hassle to deal with. Having smooth flattened hair over his traditional spiky hair really messed with him sometimes. Also, before I forget Naruto snapped his fingers and reached into his weapons pouch on his hip, here is a Horatian kunai I made. Just like my father's, it will notify me of its use once it has been thrown. Use it if the village is in an emergency or you need me back for an important reason. I don't know if it'll work since I'll be in another world altogether, but it wouldn't hurt to try. But that being said, Naruto gave the marked kunai to the sixth Okage, and Raiden digested this newfound information as well. Interesting, a teleportation technique based on focal points placed in these kunai. Naruto is certainly not one to be underestimated for his skills. Thought Raiden, even more confident he made the right choice in choosing this shinobi to represent Earthrealm. But goodbyes exchanged, a final farewell was given to the current Hokage. Raiden then walked up to Naruto, told him they were going to be transported via his lighting, and placed a hand on his shoulder. With a quick shout and a crackle of lighting, both warriors were gone from the Hokage's office. I hope that wherever he goes, Naruto affects others with his positivity like he did us, said Kakashi as he talked to himself. With that being concluded, he gathered some final paperwork to finish at home and looked out his window to the sunset. An Earth Realm on the Special Forces base. Once leaving the elemental nations, Raiden and Naruto continued to travel to various realms. Despite his best efforts, Raiden could not locate another realm with life that could defend Earth Realm. It seemed his best chance would be with Naruto, which he did not mind. After concluding he would not be able to travel much longer without exhausting himself and possibly getting them both stranded, he returned back home. But the flash of lightning, Raiden appeared with Naruto back in Earthrealm Special Forces base. This time, he interrupted a debriefing that was being given by Johnny Cage to Cassie Cage's team. Seeing his longtime friend, Johnny Cage paused what he was saying and gestured for everyone to look. After seeing Raiden, each member of Cassie's team showed respect, either by nodding or giving a bow. Greetings warriors, I apologize for my long absence and interruption. I was able to scout the various realms and could only find one with life strong enough to help our cause. Worry not, however, as he is a dependent combatant with fighting experience. Please welcome the newest Earthrealm defender, Naruto Uzumaki from the Elemental Nations, said Raiden as he gestured towards the blonde-haired ninja. Seeing that all eyes were now on him, Naruto decided to speak. Nice to meet you all, as mentioned by Raiden, my name is Naruto. I don't know much about Earthrealm or how things are run around here, however, I wish to be a great assistance to you all. I am a shinobi or ninja as you may say. I thank you for having me here. Naruto then gave a bow of respect to the others in the room. Whoa, you're a ninja from another world. Asked a perplexed Akita. Yes, I am, responded Naruto with a small smile. So if you don't mind me asking, said Johnny Cage, how old are you? You don't seem much older than my daughter and her squad members. I am 20 years of age, responded Naruto accordingly. The comfortable atmosphere was soon interrupted by a person scoffing. Big whoop, so Raiden brought back a kid our age. How is he even going to help if he's not as experienced? Expressed an annoyed Kung Jin. Don't get him wrong, he doesn't have anything personal against this Naruto individual, but the way Raiden made it sound felt as if he was some big hot shot. I did not say I didn't have experience, began Naruto with narrowed eyes to Kung Jin, I simply said I'm 20 years old. 
I've actually been on countless missions since I was a young child and I've even fought in a world war. Please don't assume my age brings in experience, finished Naruto. After a nod from Raiden to show he confirmed Naruto's allegations, Kung Jin gained a small blush of embarrassment for sounding like a complete ass in front of his team. Jack Wee kept her laughs muffled under the palm of her hand. It wasn't every day that somebody was able to shut up Kung Jin in a few seconds. Well, I for one think if he has the capabilities to help, then let him assist us, said Cassie Cage. She didn't have a problem with working with others, after all, she started working with both Takeda and Kung Jin not too long ago. If somebody was willing to help, they had the right spirit and could fight, they were alright in her book. I second that sweetheart, said Johnny Cage as he gave a smile to his daughter. Cassie just groaned in embarrassment from having her father call her that in front of the people she worked with. She couldn't handle her father's antics sometimes. If you would like to, I welcome Naruto to join Cassie's team. However, before you go on any official mission together, I think you should all get to know each other better with training exercises and team night outs. What do you say? Asked Johnny Cage with a grin. He knew the new kid meant well, but until he mingled with the rest of the team, he would be treated with caution. While this may sound like an excuse to slack off, it was truly for the benefit of the team to gain a better understanding of teamwork. Both Raiden and Naruto shared a quick glance before Naruto looked to Johnny Cage and gave a short nod in acceptance. Seeing Naruto's approval of joining the team, Johnny walked over, clasped his arm over the younger adult's shoulders, and began walking him over to Cassie's team. Knowing he was finished for now, Raiden gave a quick farewell and returned to the Jinsei chamber to recover his strength. Traveling to multiple realms drained him fairly well, and he needed to catch up on any events that passed while he was gone. So, has Raiden explained anything at all? Such as what the Shirai Ryu clan is? Who Kotal Khan is? Or even what the Black Dragon is? Asked Johnny Cage in rapid succession. He needed to know how well versed this newcomer was so he could catch him up in this world's politics. Seeing Naruto shake his head, Johnny knew he had a lot on his plate to catch him up. He wished Sonya was here, she was always better at explaining events than he was. Knowing he would have to update the blonde, he simply told Naruto to take a quick seat and that he would be back with him shortly. He then walked over to Cassie's team and finished his debriefing. So, with Naruto's addition to the team, I expect you all to treat him with respect. However, before you can all mingle with each other, I will catch him up with our world's history. While I am doing that, you all will continue with your first official mission together. Johnny then walked over to some documents on the table. As I was explaining earlier, things have gone dark with our ally, the Lin Kuei clan. I need you all to investigate and locate Sub-Zero. After finding the Grandmaster, make sure to identify where his allegiance lies. We can't afford the Lin Kuei to break away, we never know how the outworld situation can develop. Explained Johnny Cage with a straight face. Wait a minute, I thought Outworld was our ally after the Riaiko Accords. Said Kung Jin. They are, but you can never trust an alliance built on a piece of paper. Plus, they are currently undergoing a civil war. If the opposing side wins and Kotal Khan is toppled, these accords won't mean anything, and we may have another conflict with Outworld, responded Johnny Cage. After hearing what her father had to say, Cassie was the next person to speak up. What do we do if Sub-Zero has betrayed us? Johnny turned towards his daughter and spoke, if that's the case, you all have my full permission to neutralize him and bring him to me. I repeat, neutralize the Grandmaster, do not kill him. I don't need the Lin Kuei clan breathing down our necks because we killed their leader. Do I make myself clear? After seeing everybody nod, Johnny finished up the debriefing. Good, go ahead and rest, you all leave first thing tomorrow morning. For now, gather whatever supplies you need for the mission and prepare for a fight if things go south. See you all at 0700 dismissed. After everybody got up to leave, Johnny walked over to Naruto and began leading him out of the base. Alright ninja boy, before we get you into Cassie's team, we have to verify your identity. Now, since we won't have any records of you because you're not from Earth, we'll have to make up some fake ones. Explained Johnny Cage. Naruto simply nodded since he wasn't unfamiliar with forging fake documents. He had seen many fake travel documents and identities in his lifetime as a shinobi. Although being called ninja boy did slightly annoy him but it did also remind him of his own habit of giving nicknames. Once we have you in the system, you'll get your own keycard and be able to access appropriate stations and computers, Johnny paused once he saw the confused look on Naruto's face. Do you know what a computer is? Or even a keycard? I do not if I am being honest. We have a few similar inventions in my world, but most of these are unfamiliar to me, responded Naruto honestly. What about a television? Car? Smartphone? Motorcycle? Guns? Airplane? A roller coaster? Asked Johnny with wide eyes. After seeing Naruto shake his head no to each question, he nearly face-palmed. He would have more work than he thought in getting Naruto up to date with everything around him. 
Oh boy, we have a lot of learning to do in fact, you kind of remind me of this guy I used to know, Liu Kang. He was great at fighting and knew his way around a punch, but man did he not know much about technology. Rambled Johnny. He was a monk so he didn't get much time to access to what we have around us those were some good times. Shaking his head to clear his thoughts, Johnny Cage continued with his speech. Anyway, let's make sure you're caught up to speed. I would hate for you to get hurt because you didn't understand how something worked. Well, I might not know much in this world, but I do have a special trick to help with learning things, said Naruto. Before Johnny could respond, they both stopped walking to witness Naruto cross his fingers, and many poofs of smoke appeared. When it settled, Johnny Cage saw many copies of Naruto. Okay ninja boy, you are full of surprises, said Johnny Cage as he slowly poked one of the copies in the arm and stared at him. These are real copies, that is totally amazing. Want to see something cool? Asked Naruto with a grin. Johnny nodded and Naruto began to speak again. Go ahead and tell that clone next to you something, anything at all. But make sure you whisper it so I won't hear it. Naruto even walked away a few more feet to make his point. Seeing no harm in it, Johnny whispered a few words into the ear of the clone, and it then poofed away, along with the other copies present. Naruto then spoke, you told the clone that you were a former Hollywood movie star and specialize in kicking ass. Holy shit. Shouted Johnny Cage, that's true. I can't believe you actually got that right. After a few moments, Johnny continued to speak. That's some freaky stuff ninja boy, but I think I see the point you make. Anything the clone learns comes back to you when it poofs out of existence. Questioned Johnny. Correct Mr. Cage, said Naruto, anything the clone learns, such as from a book or speech, will be transferred into my mind after it goes away. However, there is usually a limit on how many clones can disperse at once, so I don't get overwhelmed with information. Right now, I can only handle about 12 clones comfortably dispersing at once who are actively learning. In combat, it's near infinite since I am not learning information, but using them as tools in a fight. Johnny Cage smiled and realized it would probably not be as big of a hassle as he previously thought to catch Naruto up. This would save him a tremendous amount of time. This will be perfect. Let's continue walking, I'll let you spend the night at my house until we get you a room in the barracks on base. I have a huge indoor library and access to the internet, so you'll be in learning paradise there, expressed Johnny Cage with excitement. Who could blame him? He wanted to test out this ability, call it the teacher in him. Hours later, at Johnny Cage's house, Assy Cage walked into her house with a tired sigh and shook off her shoes. She was exhausted after the debriefing earlier in the day. Once the team left the base, they decided to go eat at a local restaurant near the military base. They sat down and enjoyed each other's company, or at least tried to. The topic of Naruto soon came up, and each team member felt he would be a great addition to the team, it also helped that he was around their age. Not many young warriors were knowledgeable about Earthrealm, and even fewer were willing to fight for it. The only person to have a problem with the shinobi seemed to be Kung Jin. As he just assumed he was still embarrassed by being wrong back at base, or he was afraid Naruto would show him up in terms of skill. After finishing up their food, Cassie was left with the bill. It was tradition to occasionally place the bill on her card since she was the general's daughter, and they had an inside joke she was the richest military brat on the planet. Cassie didn't mind it, however, and it felt as though the team was making genuine progress in learning how to work with each other. In the beginning, it was only Cassie and Jack we working together. Eventually, Takeda and Kung Jin joined the team. This was rough in the beginning, since the girls did not get along with the guys initially. It was actually Cassie's father who thought of having these team night outs and encouraging conversation to help counteract this problem. She was shocked it worked so well, but she assumed ever her father could be right every now and then. As Cassie left her shoes at the front door, she walked deeper into her home. She heard a noise coming from her father's gaming room that he installed after the divorce with her mom. She would occasionally catch her dad playing a game of whatever caught his interest and would sometimes join him. As she turned the corner to view what was going on, Cassie blinked a few times. In front of her, she witnessed her father and Naruto both playing a game on a console. It was a racing game to her knowledge and both were bumping into each other while yelling about how the other would win. They seemed like best buddies from high school. As she looked around the room, she saw multiple copies of Naruto placed nearby. Some clones were on her father's computer accessing the internet and looking around, many others were reading from her father's personal library, and others were simply enjoying nearby games. She saw two copies of the blonde going back and forth on a game of foosball in the corner of the room. Another three copies were playing darts and complaining about who had the better score. Overall, the room was chaotic but hilarious in her opinion. Of course, leave it to the easygoing personality of the amazing Johnny Cage to warm up to the newcomer in a matter of hours. It was also refreshing for Cassie as she saw somebody finally bond with her father, albeit temporarily. While he never complained about company, she saw the occasional loneliness in her father's eyes. 
after the divorce with her mother and her being on constant missions, her father didn't have much company in the large house. It also gave her a new perspective on the blonde-haired warrior. Seeing the normally professional and curious newcomer yell at her father how he was cheating brought amusement to her. The final straw was when finally Naruto won the race as he crossed the final lap before her father. He stood up, pointed a finger at Johnny, and yelled how he was the greatest racer ever. Not being able to stay hidden anymore, Cassie finally cracked. Hearing faint giggles, both Johnny and Naruto, along with his copies, turned their head towards Cassie Cage, hiding behind a corner of the room. Naruto, the main one, felt a blush of embarrassment crawl up his neck and onto his face. He was caught yelling about his fictional achievements in front of a potential teammate. He didn't even sense her emotions while she was there, which was most likely because he was too focused on the video game. As for Johnny, he let out a laugh. It served the blonde right, that was the first win the shinobi got all night, and it was ruined by his daughter's appearance. At first, when both individuals came into Johnny's house, they were focused on Naruto learning as much as he could in a short amount of time. This prompted Naruto to make as many clones as he could handle, and each one focused on learning something new. Over the course of a few hours, he now knew what an airplane was, how to operate a smartphone, and other forms of technology. In his opinion, the internet was perhaps one of the biggest inventions created in this world. Being able to have instant communication channels and currency exchange through the click of a button was something that blew his mind. The main Naruto, instead of going off and learning a new subject about this world, stayed with Johnny Cage, as he gave a background of the realms in general. He learned about the execution of Liu Kang and Kung Lao, which gave Naruto a sense of sadness. Both prize pupils of the thunderclad warrior were taken away in tragic circumstances. He also learned about the history of Earthrealm, Outworld, Edenia, and the Netherum. He was then taught about past and current rulers of the realms. The other warriors, such as Quan Kai, Jax, Kano, and many others, were also explained by Johnny Cage. Thankfully, he had pictures of some of these warriors so he could put faces to the names. Naruto personally felt that Shao Kahn terrorized Earthrealm for too long and hoped this Kotal Kahn character would be a better ruler. Johnny Cage explained the current events and how Shinnok, a fallen deity, was defeated two decades prior. His amulet, which stored a large amount of power, was also explained to the shinobi. Overall, the war hero gained a much larger understanding of these realms entirely. One of the funniest moments in his opinion was that he was told by Johnny Cage to stop calling him Mr. Cage about an hour into their conversation. He said that made him feel too old and to instead call him Johnny or Handsome Devil. Naruto decided he'd just stick with Johnny for now. The learning session was going great until Johnny got a notification on his phone that a new racing game he had been waiting for months was finally released. In his excitement, Johnny purchased and downloaded the video game and handed a controller to Naruto. In his confusion, Naruto asked Johnny what the purpose of the device was. Johnny, with his surprising patience, explained how to use the controller and how video games work. After playing the game a few times, Naruto got the gist of it and that led to the eventual scene Cassie stumbled upon. The shouting between the two went from friendly banter to outright insults in only about an hour. However, it was all in good fun, and even some of Naruto's clones stopped their learning to come see what the commotion was about. Seeing more games within the room, some clones put down their books and played what they could. Coughing and getting his composure back, Naruto looked toward Cassie and apologized for his outburst. Cassie just giggled a few more times in response and said it was alright. She was just glad her dad had found someone to share a few of his hobbies with. Hey sweetheart, sorry you found us lacking off, said Johnny with a smile, but Naruto is going to stay in our guest room for tonight until we get him a room on base. I understand dad, no worries. I leave you both to enjoy the game, with a shake of her head, Cassie began to walk away. Wanting to not let this opportunity pass for his daughter to begin bonding with their newest teammate, Johnny came up with an idea on the spot. Actually kiddo, began Johnny, I'm feeling tired, I'm getting old after all. How about you take the controller and play a few rounds, it wouldn't hurt. Johnny then stood up, walked to his daughter, and placed the controller in her hands. After giving her a quick kiss on the head, he began walking away. I'll be heading to bed. Please don't cause too much of a ruckus, and also, no funny business while I'm gone, Cassie rolled her eyes at this comment. As Cassie sat down to play a few matches, both she and Naruto began speaking to one another. A few more moments later, she placed her phone that she carried around everywhere on the coffee table in front of them and started a match. Donnie then walked into his kitchen and poured himself a cup of water before bed. He always did this as a routine from his acting days as a way to stay healthy and it kind of just stuck after he left Hollywood. He also decided to grab some snacks to eat before he went to bed. Just as he was finishing up in the kitchen and turned off the lights, he heard something that made him smile. His daughter was laughing hysterically. As he slowly crept up on the pair, he saw Cassie having much more fun than he expected. 
His daughter, who was usually calm and collected like her mother, was having a lot of fun. It was Naruto's goofy attitude and jokes that made her laugh at times. He really had an infectious personality. She was so caught up in the game, she didn't even notice her phone buzzing multiple times on the coffee table. The constant messages she was receiving that would normally have her full attention fell by the wayside as she played a video game with somebody from another world. Johnny looked upon his daughter fondly. It looks like this kid is already having a positive effect on my family. It looks like Raiden really picked someone special. Not only does he have combat experience, but he has something bigger. A good heart, that's something you can't teach thought Johnny Cage as he stared at his daughter having fun for once with somebody she had barely known for a day. He hadn't seen his daughter have this much childish fun with somebody in a long time. Even with her teammates, the closest she would have fun with is Jackie, but most of it was on missions. Kicking back like this was something he enjoyed to see. Too much work and you could get lost in it. He knew from personal experience as he stared into the portrait containing him, Sonya and Cassie when Cassie was still young. However, if somebody were to look, they could see him staring into the eyes of Sonya's portrait. Looks like I don't have to worry about her if Naruto stays around as Johnny began walking upstairs to his room, he had one final realization, that's the first time I've heard her laugh like that since my divorce with her mommy hope she keeps that laugh with that, he walked into his room and went to bed. Teamwork makes the dream work. Once Naruto and Cassie were done playing the video game, both set down their controllers on the coffee table and turned off the television. Naruto then poofed his copies out of existence, got the rush of information they had been collecting for hours, and stored it away in his mind. At first, Naruto was about to get up and say goodnight, but Cassie initiated the conversation. She wanted to get to know the blonde better, so they stayed up for a while as he recounted some of his adventures when he was younger. Cassie still couldn't believe how deadly the missions Naruto went on while he was a kid. This abuser guy he mentioned was crazy strong in her book, even if he treated this Haku person like a tool. She was glad he was able to repent in the end for his sins and share one last moment with his friend. The biggest shock to Cassie was Naruto recounting stories about the war he participated in. While she had trouble keeping up with things such as the tailed beasts and the hidden villages, she understood enough about the conflict to make her think that Naruto was a powerful warrior in his own right. I mean, who else can deal with a guy who can willingly chuck meteors at you? She also shared some of her experiences with Naruto, such as how she joined the special forces and how she climbed the ranks. Naruto asked about each member of her team, so she gave what she knew about each member to the best of her ability. It was nothing strategic as to what their weapons or moves were, but instead how their personality was. She explained that she was closest to Jackie, while Kung Jin and Takeda were relatively new to the team. She was considered the captain of the squad and usually gave the orders. She also shared a little about her upbringing and how she was the daughter of General Sonya Blade. However, despite being the daughter of a movie star and military officer, her life was far from perfect. Cassie spilled how her parents' divorce at a young age really affected her, and she went through life blaming herself at times. Even Cassie herself couldn't understand why she was spilling so much personal information about herself, but she chalked it up to holding it in for a long time and finally being able to let it out. Plus, Naruto seemed to be a good listener if his body posture was to be believed. He just had this warm aura around him that made her want to trust him, almost like a leader's charisma. Naruto took all this in stride and offered his condolences with sincerity. While he couldn't understand having divorced parents, he could understand how it negatively affected Cassie. Feeling like a burden is something that Naruto was all too familiar with as that's how he viewed himself when he was younger. His Team 7 which consisted of him, Sasuke, Sakura and Kakashi, constantly reminded him he was the dead last of the team. For the longest time, he felt like he was holding the team back. If he was being honest with himself, this was also the reason Naruto pushed himself so far, he never wanted to feel like a burden again. The conversation between Cassie and Naruto got strangely personal with their lives, but neither had a problem with it. For Cassie, it was nice speaking to somebody other than her father or Jackie about her problems. As for Naruto, he was glad he had a new friend and comrade he could be himself around. So Naruto, I wanted to ask, how were you able to leave your world? I mean, didn't your parents object? Wondered Cassie. However, Cassie wondered if she said something wrong when Naruto suddenly stopped and lowered his head. She couldn't even see his eyes as his hair covered them. Before she could say anything, Naruto began to speak. I was orphaned shortly after I was born and didn't have any parents my whole life. So I guess you can say I didn't have anybody back home to look after. No parents to speak of or any siblings. Said Naruto with a solemn expression. Oh god, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to pry about such a sensitive subject. Responded Cassie, with regret in her voice. She felt horrible about reminding Naruto of such a terrible fact. Quickly raising his head, Naruto looked her in the eyes and sported a small grin. Don't worry about it, you didn't know. No harm, no foul. 
Plus, I've learned to live with it long ago, and I even got to meet both of them in their own way. Hasi then saw Naruto in a new light. Who could go through such a lifetime of no parents, nobody to hold you when you cry, nobody to nurse you back to health when sick, nobody to love you as a baby, and come out the other end with a smile. Desperate to change the subject, Cassie was about to speak again when they both heard a soft buzz come from the coffee table. Realizing it was her cell phone, Cassie groaned and picked up the device, already assuming who was on the other end. After scrolling through the multiple missed messages and calls, Cassie shut off her phone and threw it across the room onto the couch. Noticing how her behavior shifted into annoyance, Naruto spoke up in concern. Are you alright? Asked Naruto in a soft tone. Looking into his eyes, Cassie responded, yeah I'm fine, I'm just annoyed after looking at my phone. My ex-boyfriend, Dylan, keeps blowing up my phone. I've never had the best of luck with boys, and I've had two ex-boyfriends before, but Dylan is my most recent ex. Aiming her composure, Cassie continued, the problem is that Dylan won't leave me alone. He always tries to contact me, and I guess Cassie began to rub her arm, I'm also the problem by having late night calls with him. This came as a shock to Naruto, he never assumed Cassie had relationship issues in his mind. It also didn't help that he saw Cassie as a strong pillar, but here in front of him, she seemed like a vulnerable schoolgirl. This just showed him how you never know what problems someone is going through. After noticing Naruto's silent gaze, Cassie decided to break the silence again. So, anyways, he's been more annoying than usual because I've been extremely busy lately. I also think he still has feelings for me, but I don't know how to deal with that. I won't lie, the thought of going back to him has crossed my mind, but I also didn't like the way he treated me while we were dating. Instantly, Naruto perked up, he didn't hit you or anything like that right Cassie. Shaking her head, Cassie responded, oh no, nothing like that. Even if he tried to lay a hand on me, I would have handled it, right after my parents got a piece of him though. Naruto chuckled at the thought because from what he understood, he could definitely see Cassie's parents beating the stuffing out of any boyfriend that beat her. He just ignored me constantly and would go out to parties without telling me. A breach of trust kind of thing, he just didn't consider my feelings a lot of the time, Cassie admitted. So then, what changed tonight? Why threw your phone over there Naruto pointed to the couch across the room, instead of answering him. Because for once, I don't need Dylan for his company. I made a new friend and he's good enough for me, Cassie finished with a small smile. Realizing what her words meant, Naruto also agreed with her. He almost found it crazy how quickly he could make a new friend in another world, but he wasn't complaining. He then raised his fist and held it out to Cassie. After a few moments, Cassie understood what Naruto was doing and let out a giggle. You're such a dork for giving me a fist bump by the way. Nonetheless, Cassie gave a fist bump back and solidified her new friendship with a warrior from another realm. Looking over at the clock on the wall, Cassie's heart sank. Oh shit, it's late. I'm only going to get a few hours of sleep. Said Cassie with wide eyes. After also seeing the time, Naruto was surprised himself. He got lost in conversation with Cassie for so long, he would get about four hours of sleep at most. However, he could handle it, but he did feel sorry for making Cassie stay up so late. I'm sorry about that Cassie. I didn't mean to keep you up so late. Apologized Naruto with a sincere expression. Don't worry, it's not that big of a deal. But, I should head to bed since it's late. Did my dad show you where the guest bedroom is? Asked Cassie. No he didn't responded a sheepish Naruto, not wanting to take up more of Cassie's time. Just like dad, remembering the important stuff but skipping over the small details, thought Cassie with a small shake of her head. No worries, I'll show you where it is. Feel free to make yourself comfortable while you're here, anything in the kitchen is free game except my dad's wine. He doesn't drink much, and it's more of a collection thing for him, shrugged Cassie, not really understanding why her father collected so many different wines. Thank you, Cassie, bowed Naruto, I appreciate your family's hospitality. It means a lot to me. Finished Naruto with a large smile. No need to bow to me, it's no issue for me to help out, Cassie then began walking towards the guest bedroom, follow me and I'll show you around, but that being settled, both individuals walked in comfortable silence as they reflected on how they became friends in such a short time. Neither knew this friendship would last much longer than expected. The next day, Naruto stood in front of General Blade as he continued his training. He ran laps, lifted weights, and trained in firearm practice with Ms. Blade's platoon. Earlier in the day, when he first woke up, he was served breakfast by Johnny Cage. While he was no master cook, he had enough knowledge to get down to the basics. After thanking Johnny again for his hospitality, which Johnny simply waved off, Naruto began to eat. It was only bacon, eggs, and sausage, but it meant the world to the blonde. It almost reminded him of when he would eat breakfast with Yureya with that fatherly feeling. Passy then joined them soon after and ate alongside the newcomer. All three individuals chatted about their plans for the day, and Naruto wondered if this was what it was like to have a family. 
Once breakfast was over, Johnny explained that while Cassie and her team were tracking down Sub-Zero, Naruto would be training with General Blade. Johnny himself had other matters to attend to that required his attention. This didn't bother Naruto as he now has an opportunity to meet the final member of the Cage Blade family and also show off his skills. However, he would soon be slightly disappointed when it did come to pass. Shaking off his thoughts, Naruto continued to run laps with the other soldiers as Sonya Blade watched with crossed arms. Thankfully, she did not require him to change out of his clothes and he could keep what he was wearing. He was slightly disappointed because training was not what he thought it would be. The average citizen in Earthrealm did not possess the strength he was used to dealing with, even as a trained soldier. The laps they were running exhausted many of the military officers, but he was as cool as a cucumber. Even meeting General Blade was unpleasant in Naruto's eyes. After Johnny gave General Blade a quick introduction, he patted him on the back and left to conduct his mission. Sonya did not look at him long before she expressed that no matter who he was, he would have to work as hard as the others. Naruto agreed as he did not like being handed anything and believed in working for what you wanted. However, ever since training with her platoon, Naruto almost felt like General Blade had a cold attitude. She rarely smiled, had a serious demeanor most of the time, and commanded in a harsh tone. It wasn't anything scary or unusual to the blonde as he had seen people like this before, but he did not expect it out of somebody who used to be married to the goofball Johnny Cage. It was a wonder that she and Johnny ever had a daughter together in his mind. As the soldiers and Naruto continued running laps, Sonya Blade eyed the newest recruit. She had spoken to Raiden earlier in the day and was notified this newcomer was from another realm. Not only was he from another world, but he would also be joining her daughter's squad. This is why she may have seen Dexter harsh in his training and she wanted to make sure he had the capabilities to keep up with her daughter's team. While she may seem like a cold woman to others, she tried her best to keep her daughter safe. Hearing approaching footsteps, Sonya looked over her shoulder to see Kenshi Takahashi walking towards her. The blind warrior was an ally of Earthrealm and would be seen helping the special forces regularly. Ah, Sonya. Good to see you. Said Kenshi with a smile. Likewise Kenshi. Although I have to ask, is something wrong? wondered Sonya. Kenshi normally didn't visit her unless something needed her attention. Nothing major, I just wanted to speak to you about the newest recruit, Kenshi then paused as Sonya tracked the person he was speaking of. We both know he is holding back much of his power. He is not even breathing hard or sweating, and you've made him run triple the amount of laps the others have. I'm sure he notices this as well. Kenshi knew the newcomer was strong, very strong. His ancestors, who guided him, showed him an insight into the blonde's power, and he was stunned. This young adult definitely had the skills to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with many of the realm's fighters. Where are you going with this Kenshi? Asked Sonya, straight to the point. I am saying allow him to stop training with the fellow soldiers and to express himself in a more appropriate manner. I am asking you to let me spar with him and gauge his abilities. Sonya thought about the benefits and slowly agreed with Kenshi's idea. Letting the blonde-haired shinobi spar with somebody as capable as Kenshi would allow Sonya to see where he stands in terms of fighting ability. Hey Naruto shouted Sonya to the people running laps. Naruto turned his head toward the general and stopped running. Come over here, we have a change of plans for you. Continued Sonya. Walking over, Naruto was then introduced to the blind warrior Kenshi. After speaking with both parties and agreeing to a friendly spar, Naruto and Kenshi walked towards a secluded environment. Sonya left the training of the platoon to a trusted officer and left to follow both fighters. After a few minutes of walking, Naruto, Kenshi, and Sonya arrived at an empty building. The space inside was huge, and there were various weapons, padding, and obstacles around the room. This is our training area for our soldiers, explained Sonya, you and Kenshi can have your spar here, just be sure to not break anything. Nodding his head, Naruto walked towards the center of the room with Kenshi following closely behind. Afterward, both warriors stood in front of the other. Don't worry about hurting the young one, instead, show me what you can do in a real fight. I promise not to use Sento Kenshi pointed to the sword strapped on his back, unless you wish me to do so. Naruto then smiled and told Kenshi he had no problem with him using his katana and the spar. Furthermore, I have no issues with using abilities, just be sure to not break this building and too, I believe Ms. Blade would have both our heads if we did, smiled Kenshi. Agreeing with a blind warrior, both fighters separated and settled into their fighting stances. I can't wait to have my first spar in this world, I'll finally get a feel of how strong the warriors are here. However, I think it's best I don't release any destructive techniques while we spar. It's better to stay mostly with hand-to-hand -hand combat and projectiles. Don't want to tear this building down after all, thought an excited Naruto. Naruto also decided to keep his current gravity level seals and only release them if the spar permitted itself to do so. With a quick nod from Kenshi, both warriors dashed at each other to begin. 
On the sidelines, Sonya crossed her arms, studied both fighters and kept her eyes open to truly see how this spar would go. She wouldn't admit it, but she also wanted to see how this ninja would compare to somebody of Kenshi's caliber. Naruto dashed at high tune and levels of speed toward Kenshi to begin the spar. To Kenshi's credit, he did not have difficulty keeping up with his opponent. He had lived a lifetime of combat and fraught beings just as fast as what Naruto was displaying. Kenshi and Naruto clashed in a flurry of fists, kicks, dodges, and more. Kenshi aimed a palm strike toward Naruto's chest, but his quick reaction allowed for him to sidestep and duck last minute. Naruto tried to counteract with a left hook to Kenshi's midsection, but Kenshi blocked the blow with Sento's sheath. Interesting, so even Kenshi is holding back as well. That hook should have connected, but he was able to grab the katana off his back, keep it sheathed, and use it to block my blow just in time. He has a quicker reaction time than I gave him credit for, I won't make that mistake again, thought Naruto with narrowed eyes. And she had a smile that had not left his face since the beginning of the spar. That kid is fast, but now he's realizing that Kenshi is no pushover. How will you react to this quick exchange, Naruto? Pondered Sonya. In the next moment, Kenshi made his move. As soon as Naruto's hook landed on Kenshi's sheath blade, he used the momentum of the attack to allow it to move him slightly across the floor. After sliding for a split second, he was on the attack. Kenshi first threw a leg kick to Naruto's jaw, which he was able to dodge by moving his head back. This didn't bother the blind warrior as he immediately switched into a low leg sweep which Naruto was able to hop over. As Naruto was landing back on the ground, Kenshi was already in motion. From his leg sweep, Kenshi spun around and swung his sheath blade into Naruto's jaw. Seeing as he didn't want to get hit by this, Naruto brought up his right arm to absorb the blow. With a slight grunt at the force of the hit, Naruto pushed the blade away and gave a quick left jab. Kenshi was able to move his head out of the way, but not entirely. The jab slightly nicked Kenshi's face, which resulted in a minuscule cut that showed a small drop of blood. Realizing that Naruto's blows had the potential to cause serious damage, Kenshi played a more cautious game. Kenshi jumped back slightly, while Naruto used this time to give a quick step back as well. Not bad so far young one, very impressive, said Kenshi. Thank you, said Naruto with a smile, but how about we use some of the weapons we have? You use your katana and I get to use my kunai. Fair deal. Kenshi, never one to say no to using his prized weapon, agreed. Hearing the faint ting of a sword being drawn, Sonya bit her lip in slight anticipation. I hope you know what you're doing Kenshi, can't have you seriously hurting Raiden's newest recruit, thought the military general. Naruto reached into his kunai pouch and withdrew a standard kunai in his right hand. Kenshi stood ready to intercept the weapon as he believed it would be thrown at him. Imagine his surprise when instead of throwing the weapon, Naruto charged at him. Not one to back down, Kenshi prepared for a battle of blades. The sound of metal hitting metal rang out in the mostly empty training room of the special forces base. Kenshi could tell that Naruto had improved his reaction times, possibly because of his earlier slip up with the left hook. On the other hand, Naruto could tell Kenshi had extreme proficiency with his blade. He blocked, parried, and maneuvered himself, so that spoke he had years of experience working with Sento. However, Naruto was no slouch either. His training and experience of working with Kunai helped him keep an even ground with the blindfolded combatant. Seeing that they were at a stalemate, Naruto decided to use his unpredictability. While well, he could have ended this spar going all out from the beginning or even using higher speeds that he was capable of, that was not the point of the spar at all. It was to test both warriors against each other without aiming to kill the other. After causing a quick spark to appear with his kunai, Naruto thought of a plan on the spot. Each time his kunai was angled at the right spot, Kenshi would clash, and a metal spark would appear. Using this information, Naruto timed it so that when he implemented the next blade clash, a metal spark appeared once again. However, this time, Naruto withdrew a second kunai from his leg pouch the moment the spark was in Kenshi's face. It was less than a second. Assuming Kenshi did not see him withdraw a second kunai, Naruto brought the second blade and aimed to cut Kenshi's right arm. To his surprise, Kenshi used a red hue energy source to push him back. It didn't make him fly across the room, but it did create a small gap between both warriors. Wow, I'm surprised you saw me draw my second kunai and react in time, admitted Naruto. And she smiled in response, you assumed I could not see because the metal spark blocked my vision. However, my ancestors guide my sight, and Sento is a medium for this. I do not need my eyes to see. Feeling even more excited with this newfound information, Naruto prepared himself to charge back into battle. However, Sonya Blade had seen enough from the spar. Actually, that's enough for now. Naruto, feel free to take a break and join the soldiers once you have recovered. Kenshi, you're with me as I need to discuss a few things with you. Expressed Sonya. After thanking Kenshi for the spar and nodding to Sonya, Naruto took his leave and left the building they were in. I believe you wish to discuss the young one's abilities General Blade. Asked Kenshi. I do, what is your assessment of him? 
asked Sonya in a firm tone. For one, he is not new to combat. He was very calm throughout our exchange which is unusual for someone so young. He was never once caught off guard or had an accelerated heartbeat, almost like he knew he could overtake me if he needed to do so, Kenshi then sheathed his sword, also, I don't know if you realize this, but he was able to hold both kunais efficiently in both hands. That tells me he was either born ambidextrous, or he taught himself how to use both hands effectively. Sonya hummed and thought, anything else you wish to add Kenshi? Yes I have a few last comments, Kenshi then began walking towards the exit. If I were to rank him, I would put him above anybody on your daughter's team in terms of battle scenarios, including my son. He is holding back so much power that we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg. His reaction time tells me he is used to fighting in high-stress environments, and his restraint tells me he knows when to hold back as well. Overall, he is a good kid with a strong combat ability. Raiden picked his new fighter well, even more than he may think. With his piece being said, Kenshi walked out the exit doors and wandered off to where he was needed on base. As for Sonya, she digested everything Kenshi said and ended with her own thoughts. I don't even know if Kenshi picked up on it, but I could tell Naruto was trying to remain even. Many times when he would clash with Kenshi's blade, his arm muscles twitched as if it was muscle memory to quickly switch stances and go for the kill. He even followed Kenshi's movements when he grabbed Sento's sheath to block his hook, and he still let the hook connect, instead of redirecting his blow. This kid is something else, but I'm very glad he's on our side, thought Sonya with a shake of her head. What a powerhouse, what kind of world do you have to come from to have an experience like that so young? But the spar being officially over, Sonya walked back to her platoon to continue their training. It was never a rest day with the general of the military. Of Cassie's team, Dakwi Briggs to squad, I've located Grandmaster Sub-Zero. He's currently kneeling in front of the Lin Kuei Palace, need an Ada to my position, stated Jack Wee into her communicator located on her wrist. She was currently peeking around the corner, about 50 feet away from the Grandmaster. Nice job Jack Wee, we'll be converging on your position. Do not engage until we arrive, over, responded Cassie. Once Cassie, Kung Jin, and Takeda arrived, they all shared a look and nodded. Alongside Jack Wee, they prepared to move in on the Lin Kuei warrior. Okay here's the plan, I will Cassie was interrupted as Kung Jin had enough of hiding and walked over to the ice-themed fighter. Damn it Jin, what are you doing? Hey, you. Sub-Zero. We need to speak with you. Yelled Kung Jin as he walked over to the person in question. He was tired of waiting and hiding in the shadows, it was about time someone took charge of this mission. I did not welcome you onto my land, what is it you are doing here? Speak quickly, or there may be consequences, stated Sub-Zero, in an eerily calm voice. Despite his words, Kuai Lang didn't look at Kung Jin, nor did he even open his eyes. His posture, if examined, revealed he was actually quite relaxed in the given situation. This is when Cassie decided to take over the conversation. Grandmaster, I am sorry for the intrusion. We just need you to follow us because once again, Cassie was interrupted by the sound of doors being shoved open crap, we're surrounded. Many Lin Kuei warriors busted out of the nearby palace and surrounded the special forces squad. They would not allow anybody to threaten their leader on their watch. It was the duty of the Lin Kuei to watch over each other. Sub-Zero stood up and walked over to the trapped young fighters. Cassandra Cage, you and your team are on my grounds, yet I sent no invitation. You are now cut off and have no escape, what shall be your solution? Questioned Kuai Lang as he stood a few feet away from the squad. Please Grandmaster, my father only ever speaks good things of you. He holds you in high regard and admires your skills. All he wishes to do is talk, please allow us to escort you to him pleaded Cassie. Your father was always a negotiator before anything else, responded Sub-Zero with his eyes scanning over the group. If talking won't work, then maybe you'll understand with our fists. Now. Shouted Kung Jin as everyone except Cassie dispersed to fight the Lin Kuei warriors. Wait, no. Stop fighting. Yelled Cassie as she looked around to see her teammates battling. You are the leader of this team, yet they do not follow your example, stated Sub-Zero before he too rushed to Cassie. Cassie threw a quick right jab which the Grandmaster ducked under. He then struck her hard with a knee to the gut and flipped her over his shoulder onto the ground. Cassie thankfully used this moment to roll backward and stand up straight. I'm glad you still have some fight in you, Cassandra Cage, now show me what you can do, finished Sub-Zero with a smirk. He then entered his fighting stance as Cassie entered hers. With no words left to say, both parties exchanged blows. At first, Cassie didn't do too bad. While she couldn't land significant damage on the Grandmaster, she was landing a good amount of hits. Granted, she was taking more than she was giving, but it was the best she could do. However, it all changed when the Lin Kuei leader began to increase the intensity of the fight. As he threw a flurry of left and right hooks aimed at Sub-Zero's jaw, which he blocked with his arms. Seeing how this would not get through his guard, Cassie changed plans. Timing her hooks, she threw a cross with her left hand aiming at her opponent's head. 
seeing what Cassie was trying to do, Sub-Zero ducked prematurely in preparation to dodge the blow. After realizing her plan worked, Cassie purposely threw her left hand upwards and used it as momentum to charge a throw a high kick. Not having enough time to doge, especially since he was now in the perfect position to be hit with a leg kick, Sub-Zero was in a tough spot. Her satisfying smack sound, Cassie smiled. Her high left kick connected with Kuai Lang's jaw and resulted in him having his head snapped to the side. Despite a quick victory, she didn't expect Sub-Zero to look in her eyes and smile. Even though his head jerked to the side, his body stayed still as if he was made of stone. Not knowing what was in store, Cassie dashed a few paces backward to create room. Kuai Lang then wiped a small amount of blood, barely noticeable, from the sides of his lip. Congratulations Cassandra Cage, you finally landed a solid blow, the first of our bout. However, allow me to repay you. Cassie was then overwhelmed as Sub-Zero fought with a harsher ferocity than seen before. His punches, kicks, and power were much quicker than before. He really must have respected her after that if he was taking her more seriously now. Even though Cassie was a trained military warrior, she did not have the experience of somebody like Sub-Zero, who had been in countless life and death battles. Huai Lang then decided it was time to end their short battle. He slipped under one of Cassie's right hooks and gave a powerful palm strike to her torso. Before Cassie could slide back due to the force of the blow, he fired a quick ice blast to her left leg. This wasn't meant to hurt her, but instead hold her in place for what he planned next. Cassie was internally freaking out from the fight. In a split second, she was leaning backward and had a frozen leg stuck to the ground. Before she could make any attempts to free herself, Kuai Lang pounced. Sub-Zero gave a sharp kick to Cassie's stomach with his left boot, which knocked the air out of her lungs. Seeing she was on the verge of passing out, Kuai Lang finished his combo with a strong somersault kick with his right left. Just as Cassie had done to him, a sick crack was heard as the blow connected under her jaw. The force of the kick was so strong, it ripped Cassie free from the ice as she landed on her back. Groaning in pain, Cassie tried shaking her blurry vision away. She could already feel a bruise forming at the bottom of her chin and a headache coming on. She tried to get off her back, but her body just wasn't responding to her at the moment. Seconds later, she blacked out from the pain and exhaustion. You fraud well Cassandra Cage, however, you still have much to learn, said Kuai Lang as he stood over the fallen combatant. He had both hands crossed behind his back and seemed to be in a relaxed stance. With a quick shout, Takeda launched a flying kick to the back of the Grandmaster, but something unexpected happened. Just as the kick connected, Sub-Zero broke into a million little ice cubes, which revealed he substituted with an ice clone last second. Standing confused, Takeda searched around for Sub-Zero, but did not hear the Lin Kuei leader approaching from behind. It happened too fast and too rapidly, but Kuai Lang gave a strong dropkick to Takeda's back and made him fall on his face. Getting back up, Sub-Zero began to talk, use your abilities, Takeda, search within me and tell me what you see. I know Kenshi taught you well. Stumbling to get back up, Takeda responded, I sense that you're being annoyingly cryptic. And if you ask me, Hanzo taught me infinitely more than my dad ever did. But the talk being over, both warriors rushed each other. Takeda was focused on speed from the start, he wanted to give Sub-Zero a run for his money. Unfortunately for him, Kuai Lang was no stranger to quickness in a fight. Every kick and fist that Takeda threw, the Grandmaster would dodge or block. Having enough of this, Takeda launched a vicious left uppercut that would have hurt if it landed, but it didn't. The blow was mere centimeters from Sub-Zero's face, and he watched it pass by in slow motion. A small miss is still a miss, and Kuai Lang was determined to make Takeda learn from the mistake. Grabbing his left arm with his right hand, Sub-Zero kept his hand raised in the air as he proceeded to land many sharp blows with his other hand. Of course, Takeda tried freeing his arm, but it was in a vice grip, so he resorted to fighting back with his other hand as well. The problem with this was that Kuai Lang would redirect each of Takeda's blows and land three more of his own. If Takeda wanted to play with speed, the Grandmaster would show him speed. After receiving a hard palm strike to his nose that rocketed his head backward, Takeda knew he was close to collapsing. A small trickle of blood ran down his nostrils from the blow. He was taking too much damage and not giving nearly enough back to be effective in the fight. Once the palm strike landed, Kuai Lang released Takeda's arm and delivered a left hook to his jaw. This put down Takeda on the ground, and he remained there groaning, nearly passed out. Hearing some shouting behind him, Sub-Zero turned around to see Jack Wee Briggs running at him. Giving a war cry, Jack Wee jumped at Kuai Lang and aimed a jumping punch to his head. Quickly dodging it, both fighters engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This miss didn't deter Jack Wee, and she launched a series of vicious blows at the Grandmaster. Sub-Zero was dodging a majority of the attacks until he blocked a strike aimed towards his liver. This proved to be a mistake because Kuai Lang felt an immense amount of pain afterward. Those gauntlets of hers must increase her power because that blow was much harder than it should have been. 
I was careless, I need to avoid as many strikes as possible. This is a fight that cannot be drawn out, or I will risk not being able to finish it, thought Kuai Lang, as he hid his own grimace of pain from the strike. Changing tactics immediately, Sub-Zero decided to focus on counter-attacks with Jack Wee, instead of trading blow for blow. He would wait, dodge, and attack accordingly. The less amount of blows that landed, the better it was for him. His counter-attacks would have to be quick, precise, and powerful, or he would be dropped. He landed a few strikes here and there, but it was nothing that would end the fight. On the other hand, Jack Wee was feeling on top of the world. The same warrior that had dropped two of her friends was now on the receiving end of her attacks, and he was hurting, she could tell. The Grandmaster hit his pain well, but she had been in enough fights to tell when someone had been hurt. Unfortunately, it was this exact feeling of control in the fight that led to Jack Wee making a minor slip-up. She overextended her fist on an overhead strike which Kuai Lang took full advantage of. With his right arm, he grabbed Jack Wee's overextended fist and brought it down. This brought Jack Wee's body down with it and into Sub-Zero's awaiting knee. The harsh knee strike to her face immediately brought Jack Wee down, and it was lights out in a matter of seconds. She crumpled to the ground and remained motionless. As for Sub-Zero, he was feeling hurt from her attacks. Out of the group he had seen so far, Jack Wee had the most power behind her blows. He could feel the small bruises that had formed from her constant barrage. She played to her strengths and Kuai Lang could respect that. Continue to improve specialist Briggs, and you'll exceed everybody's expectations, said Kuai Lang as he overlooked his fallen opponent. Hung Jin had just finished stomping out another Lin Kue warrior, and it would make the fifth he had defeated since the beginning of the skirmish. Looking over his shoulder, he saw Kuai Lang standing over a defeated Jack Wee and knew he needed to make his move. Running over, he delivered a flying kick that the Grandmaster caught in his arms. After seeing his predicament, Kung Jin pushed himself off the Lin Kuei leader and landed on the ground. You are quick to anger Kung Jin, do not let it endanger those around you, mentioned Sub-Zero as he shifted into his battle stance. Well now you're about to get a taste of my temper Grandmaster. Replied Kung Jin as he charged Kuai Lang. Another round of blows was exchanged between both combatants. Kung Jin realized that his hand-to-hand -hand skills were not going to cut it. He wasn't especially powerful, nor as quick as others on his team, and Sub-Zero had taken them out. So he knew he needed a different strategy if he wanted to win this fight. It was up to him to save his team from this situation. After backflipping over Kuai Lang's low leg sweep, Kung Jin did another backflip to gain more distance and pulled out his bow. He would make this a battle of distance. Kung Jin loaded an arrow and fired at Sub-Zero's thigh, which he sidestepped. Not discouraged in the slightest, Kung Jin began firing more arrows toward the Crymancer. As for Sub-Zero, he was playing a game of duck and roll. He couldn't afford to let an arrow pierce him or immobilize him. A few seconds of this exchange went on between both individuals. This was until Kung Jin went over his shoulder to load another arrow and felt he only had two left. With this in mind, he decided to play a risky strategy. Taking in a deep breath and aiming true, Kung Jin let loose an arrow to the Grandmaster's face. Before Kuai Lang could react, he then drew, aimed, and fired his last arrow behind the previous one. He made sure to add even more power behind this one so it could catch up to the other, and it did. To the amazement of Sub-Zero, he watched as an arrow flew to his face, and a second one appeared behind it moments later, only to split it in half. This created a perfect split down the middle of the first arrow, and allowed the second arrow to soar to his face. The perfect split created two chunks of sharp wood that were going to his wrists, while the second arrow was still on course to make contact with his skull. Techmate Sub-Zero, thought Kung Jin with a grin. This was the most ingenious move he had ever pulled off in a real fight, and he was damn proud of it. How could someone dodge three projectiles aimed at their wrists and face from such a short range? Hung Jin knew it would hurt and might even cause permanent injury to the Lin Kuei leader, but Johnny Cage said to neutralize the Siremancer. He was doing just that and would be responsible for helping his team complete the mission. He was so sure this idea would work and he would be praised. And it would have been a perfect plan if the opponent wasn't Sub-Zero. In a split second, showing just how quick his reaction time was, Kuai Lang made his move. He ducked low to the ground and brought his hands down slightly. This allowed for the arrow going to his head to soar above harmlessly, while the two pieces of wood that would have implanted themselves through his wrists flew inches above them instead. The precision needed to have these miss by the smallest margins was insane. Not only did Kuai Lang let these arrows pass overhead, but he summoned his freezing ability to make both chunks of wood have a frozen tip instead. It was more of a blunt instrument, but it was enough for what he planned. After freezing the tips of both arrows, he grabbed their tail ends and threw them back at Kung Jin. In response, Kung Jin was frozen in place with wide eyes. He watched as his flawless plan came back to hurt him, and he was stunned. This was all that was needed for two frozen arrows to hit his forehead and cause his eyes to roll back into his skull. All Kung Jin saw was darkness right after. 
Once a few minutes had passed, each fighter of Cassie's squad awoke to see themselves on their knees, hands tied behind their backs, and facing a standing sub-zero. Cassie looked over to her left and saw a Lin Kuei member put away a jar of smelling salts, which is what she assumed they all awoke to. Seeing somebody needed to take action on the situation, Cassie spoke, Sub-Zero, we're sorry for the mess we've caused on your palace ground. But please, we just wish to talk and cause no further harm. Guai Lang hummed and thought and responded, if your intentions were to speak Cassandra Cage, your team has an unusual way of expressing it. As he sighed and responded, I know look, I know it doesn't reflect well on us that we attacked you warriors, but we only need to talk. Gakui backed up her friend in a heartbeat, she's right Grandmaster, we only want to talk. Unfortunately, the time to speak has ceased to exist, said Kuai Lang in a deadly serious voice. Any other plans, Captain? Said a sarcastic Kung Jin. If you execute us here, you'll catch a lot of heat from Earthrealm's forces. I'm not just talking about our special forces, but Raiden could kill you if he finds out you purposely wiped out four of Earthrealm's defenders. Cassie knew the threat may not mean much to the Grandmaster, but she needed to find a way out of the situation. You make a valid point, Sub-Zero then points to a nearby warrior, release them. The aforementioned Lin Kuei member then pulled out his knife and cut the ropes on each squad mate individually. Cassie, Jackui, Takeda and Kung Jin then rubbed their wrists in relief from the small rope burn. Holy shit that actually worked. Said Cassie in amazement as she looked toward her team. A quick whistle then caught their attention and they saw their mentor, Johnny Cage, at the front doors of the palace grounds. Dad? What are you doing here? Instead, it was Sub-Zero who responded. This was a training simulation Cassandra Cage, not a real battle. As he scoffed in disappointment, damn it, I should have seen this. Guai Lang then began his examination of each warrior that stood before him. He decided to start from left to right, so Kung Jin was first. Kung Jin began Sub-Zero, your hand-to-hand -hand needs immense improvement. Your skills with your bow are admirable, and the ability to think on the spot is incredible, but you also prove a risk to your team with your mouth. Reign in your temper and think as a team, not as an individual. Kung Jin just put his head down and thought over his actions. Takeda, with this, Takeda stood up straighter, you are fast, however, you become sloppy the longer a fight draws on. Balance your stamina and don't burn yourself out early in a fight, it can prove fatal for your team. Takeda took the criticism in stride and vowed to improve his weaknesses. Cassandra Cage, at this point, Sub-Zero walked over to her, you command this team, but you do not lead it. It takes time and trust, but your role as captain ensures that everybody's survival relies on the decisions you make. Use everybody's strengths in a team formation instead of scattering off. Furthermore, as for your individual capabilities, they are well-rounded. You landed one of the few solid blows I had in all fights. You lack experience, which comes with life. As he pondered over the words Kuai Lang said. It was true, despite their team night outs, her team sometimes didn't follow her orders strictly. It was mainly Kung Jin a majority of the time, but even one member falling out of order can be lethal in a real fight. Finally, Jackwee Briggs mentioned Sub-Zero, you share your father's strength and resilience. However, do not let hubris be your downfall. Your blows were the most powerful out of the group, but your cockiness cost you the battle in the end. Stay balanced and quick on your feet, it'll help tremendously later on. With his part done, Sub-Zero called back all of his clan members and they walked inside their palace grounds. Thanking Kuai Lang as he walked by, Johnny Cage walked down to his daughter's team. Looks like we all learned something today. Let's head back and recover from our injuries, said Johnny. Akita and Cassie nodded especially since they were still hurting. Note to self, don't challenge Sub-Zero unless absolutely needed. That man knew his stuff. Back on base, the helicopter ride back to base was a long and informative one. Johnny Cage sat down with his team and mentioned their teamwork needed improvements. A few verbal insults between Jackwe and Kung Jin raised tension, but overall, everyone just suffered from a bruised ego. Akita's bleeding nose was fine, and Cassie took a few pills to subside the headache she sustained. Once landed, each member slowly walked onto the helipad and down the stairs. Johnny had mentioned they received new orders from General Blade so they were requested at once. As Johnny and Cassie's squad walked onto base, they were intercepted by both Kenshi and Naruto. Kenshi took the lead alongside Johnny and they began to speak. Towards the back of the group, Naruto began to speak with Cassie. How was the training exercise? Asked Naruto. Wait, you knew about it? exclaimed Cassie in surprise. Naruto nodded, yep, Kenshi told me all about it after we sparred. I thought it was pretty cool to be fighting somebody named Sub-Zero who can control ice. Must have been a tough fight if he's considered a grandmaster. Cassie thought back to the encounters she had with the Siremancer and chuckled. Yeah, you can say that again. Anyway, how did meeting my mom go for you? Did she give you the cold shoulder too? Joked Cassie. At first, she definitely did, Naruto then placed both hands behind his head as they walked behind Johnny and Kenshi. 
however, I started giving her some tactics I thought she could train the soldiers in, and she opened up a little. I even gave her some strategies to use from my homeworld and sparred with a few of her soldiers to help them out. I think she warmed up a little bit after that since I was actively helping her people, you know. Asi nodded and could understand what Naruto meant. Her mother, General Blade, was a very straight-to-the-point kind of person. If Naruto helped her platoon by actively giving away his knowledge for free simply to help, Cassie could see how that would earn her mother's respect. However, it then clicked in Cassie's mind that Naruto said something interesting. She decided to comment on this and said, wait, you know. Blushing in embarrassment, Naruto mumbled that it was a verbal tick that occasionally popped up. This earned him a giggle from Cassie, and a darker shade of red was on his face afterwards. However, started Naruto, we did have to cut off the training pretty early because a portal from Outworld appeared is what they told me. This piqued Cassie's interest, but before she could comment, they arrived at their destination. Seeing as they appeared in front of the tent and all members entered inside. They soon saw General Blade and Raiden standing around a table. Upon closer inspection, there was also a woman sitting between both warriors. Sonya turned around as she heard people approaching and scanned the occupants. Once her eyes landed on Johnny, she began to speak. Mr. Cage, please approach, we have a developing situation, she then gave her thanks to Kenshi. Seeing as they were not mentioned, Jackui, Kung Jin, Takeda and Naruto all stayed where they were and at the ready position. Cassie, wanting to see what was going on as well, moved forward with her father. Sonya noticed this and blurted out, Sergeant Cage, return to your team and remain at the ready. Cassie almost felt hurt at her mother's words, but a reassuring look from her father was all she needed to go stand by Naruto. Naruto noticed the emotions bubbling inside of Cassie and gave her a quick pat on the shoulder, which she nodded her thanks for. Raiden began the conversation, the person sitting between us is Li Mei. She is seeking asylum for her people. They wish to reside within Earthrealm. Thanking Raiden for the introduction, Li Mei began to speak, I am indeed not from Earthrealm. My village, Sundu, was the battleground of a harsh battle that took place recently. I was barely able to bring my people here and nearly lost my life in the process. Seeing how serious the situation was, Naruto narrowed his eyes and prepared to digest every word this woman would say. What made this battle so insane that you sought out Earthrealm instead of staying in Outworld? Asked Johnny Cage with his arms crossed. This battle was unlike anything we'd seen before at this moment, Lee Mei began to slightly shake. The rebels were led by Melina, and she eliminated entire groups of warriors at once. It was courtesy of her talisman that she was led to victory. Dakwi gave a worrying look to Cassie that she immediately picked up on. It was a sign that both fighters were feeling uneasy at the developing events. Li Mei gave a deep breath before she continued, there was no combat, it was a straight slaughter. Raiden chose this point to interrupt, please Li Mei, explain more about this weapon under Melina's control. She nodded and began her explanation, it is a talisman as mentioned, but it is gold-plated and consists of a center jewel. The red energy expelled from the weapon causes destruction I've never seen before. Raiden felt a jolt of surprise rush through his body, is this what I think it is? How could Shinnok's amulet return after the safeguards were enacted? Is this what my premonitions were telling me? Raiden then looked over to see Naruto deep in thought as Li Mei spoke, regardless, I am glad I did not ignore the warnings this time. I am confident no matter the answer, we can protect Earthrealm. It also seems that Naruto will play a role much sooner than I expected in Earthrealm's defense. Deep down, Raiden also felt relief. His fears were possibly not unfounded, and it reassured him he made the right decision in bringing Naruto. He could not fail him as he did Kung Lao and Yu Kang. If what are saying is true and what you are describing is accurate, I have a feeling we will all be dragged into this conflict, stated Raiden. Is it Shinnok's amulet? Asked Kung Jin from the back. This comment spurned Sonya as she turned to the Thunder God, it can't be Shinnok's amulet. We have the vault, your protective barriers, our forces, and even the Shaolin monks. Who can get past all that? This really riled up Sonya, she still had memories of what happened the last time the amulet caused chaos. Raiden stared into her eyes and stated, I must be sure. I will investigate this claim of Shinnok's amulet returning and report back with my findings. May the Elder Gods be with us all. Raiden then walked out of the war tent and disappeared with a crackle of lighting. An awkward tension filled the room as Johnny was left with General Blade standing across from him. The two previous partners were now locking eyes. Thankfully, before more tension could be filled, Li Mei broke the silence. She turned to Johnny Cage and spoke, you look like an Earthrealmer that crossed in with us. The only difference is that he had a glowing red eye. This instantly sparked Sonya's attention. Even Johnny Cage perked up at this information. Oh what does that mean? Asked Akita to Jackui, who simply shrugged in response. Sonya decided to take action and started to give commands, Kenshi, stay here with Li Mei. She then began hastily walking out towards the exit of the war tent. 
I'll be heading to the refugee camp and investigating the claims provided by Lee May, can't let him escape this time. Donnie was then able to catch up and gave his own comment, I'll come with you, don't want you to handle it solo. Sonya stopped walking and shook her head, negative, you're going to get an update on our security from Colonel Flagg. Donnie didn't understand this decision and asked a simple question, why? Sonya responded with a blunt truth, because then I won't have you here with me. Hassi, feeling fed up at this point of her father being disrespected, began walking to her parents. Johnny instantly noticed this and stopped her by holding out his hand, signaling it was okay. He then gave one final look at Sonya and walked out to begin his duties. The tension between Cassie and Sonya is much heavier than I expected thought Naruto. It hurt to see he was treated better by the woman than her own daughter was. Hassi finally walked up to her mother and spoke, so then are we joining you? Sonya then sighed and answered her daughter, negative. You'll be going to Outworld. We need to ensure that Lee Mei's story rings true, so you'll be conversing with Kotal Kong. In fact, Naruto she then looked at the shinobi, will be joining you on his first official mission as a special forces member. He is now under your command. With all that being said, Sonya then walked out and marched to apprehend the criminal she was after. Hassi just stared at her mother's retreating form and sighed, no matter what, it seemed like the gap was still there between them. Before she could dwell in her thoughts anymore, a hand grasped her left shoulder. She turned to see Naruto smiling a bright grin in her direction. So boss, I am officially yours to order around he then placed both hands behind his head, just please promise me you won't make me do any bathroom duty. Hassi smiled and shook her head. Her new friend always seemed to be able to bring her out of a bad mood. After turning around, she began to address her team. Family drama aside, Cassie knew what needed to be done. All right team, Cassie looked into the eyes of her squadmates, we have our orders. Next stop, Outworld. Forging bonds, an Outworld street market, keep your eyes on alert people, we're on lookout duty for any signs of Kotal Khan or how to contact him, stated Cassie calmly, leading the group through a market. Akita, Naruto, Kung Jin, Jackui, and Cassie were currently wandering in Outworld after being given their mission by General Blade. After being teleported from their technology on base, they had arrived in the realm. Seeing that teleportation portal pop up for the first time was pretty unique. Would love to learn that skill and travel freely among the realms here, thought Naruto as he walked along with the group. Honestly, the people here look similar to us. I thought they would look bigger with sharp teeth. Plus, the sky has a normal color, I was expecting a dark gray to be honest with you, stated Takeda as he looked around in amazement. Dakwi chuckled in response, you need to lay off the horror movies. Neither knew how close Takeda was to his prediction if they knew what a Tarkatan was. So, Naruto, how does it feel using our world's technology? Asked Jackwi. She wanted to get to know their new team member a bit better. Oh, this thing. Naruto then touched the communicator situated snugly in his inner ear. It's honestly pretty amazing you can speak through this over long distances. Really handy and I personally like how you can't really feel like it's there, right? They're pretty nifty if you ask me. Said Takeda. He remembered when he first received his. Naruto was given his own communicator by General Blade before the team made their way to Outworld. It would give him the ability to speak to his squad if they got separated or needed to communicate in general. After tuning it to the right frequency and testing it out, he was pretty excited about it. All he needed to do was tap it lightly to activate it and it would automatically contact each squad mate. He could also alter it to specifically contact an individual if needed. The wonders of advanced technology. Hearing the conversation taking place behind her, Cassie smiled and spoke, hate to cut the chit chat team, but we need to see if we can find any ways to contact Kotal Khan. We could be on the verge of war here and we need to make haste. I've been meaning to ask spoke Jackwi, after hearing what Lee May said, we could possibly be facing an invasion. However, that would violate the Riaiko Accords. Why would Outworld risk a conflict with Earthrealm? Who knows? Shrugged Takeda, but I've also been thinking if Outworld is our ally, why didn't they help us back during the Netherum War? Back when Quan Kai was causing problems along with his team of Takeda looked over at Jackwi and tried to find a better word to describe the people that her father used to associate with. Revenants. They're called Revenants. Just like how Jackwi's dad used to be. Smugly answered Kung Jin over his shoulder. Hucking asshole whispered Jackwi. Seeing how he didn't mean to push her buttons as much as he did, Kung Jin stopped his pace, and so did the others. Turning around, he answered his teammates questions, we don't have an alliance with Outworld, instead, we have a non-aggression pact. We don't attack them, they don't attack us, and vice versa. At the end of the day, Outworld is not our ally, not truly. Hey guys, Naruto chose this moment to speak up with sharp eyes, I'm sensing a large group of people heading our way, and they don't feel friendly. Wait feel? What do you mean by that? Questioned Takeda. Seeing how the people would soon reach them, Naruto answered in the quickest way possible, I can feel people's emotions. 
Surprised at this information, Takeda was not able to further comment as a cowboy and a group of Outworld soldiers intercepted the Earthrealm team. Neat trick you have there pal. I could hear your warning from back there. Stated the Western warrior. The cowboy then straightened himself out and spoke with authority, now, name why you're here. Make it convincing or we might have to kill you. Seeing the potential for bloodshed, Naruto discreetly put a kunai into his left palm. He needed to be ready in case things went south. Wait a minute. I can read you, that means you're from Earthrealm. Exclaimed a shocked Akita. He activated his mind-reading abilities that he learned from his father, and now they were paying off. You're right, I'm from Earthrealm. But Kotal Khan is my employer, and he's from Outworld. So guess what? I'm from Outworld. The cowboy then placed his hand on his revolver. I believe I said to name your business, you have one last chance. As he then spoke up, we're here on Raiden's approval, we need to speak to Kotal Khan. We're here as diplomats. I have Raiden's official seal with me here. As he then reached into her back pocket and revealed the seal given to her by Raiden as proof of his complicity. However, the man in front of her didn't look convinced at all. That's a great seal you have there, but to me, it looks like I can buy 20 of those from the vendors here. Hung Jin finally had enough and spoke, look, you can kill all of us if you need to. But, if we're right in what we're saying, your employer can cut your wage if you get what I mean. However, if you take us to him, we can tell him you subdued us and have the luxury of being promoted by your boss. What do you say? Wang has options, the cowboy spoke after a few moments. Stay close. In case you do any funny business, just know you died to Aaron Black. I give my name out so you can have the honor of knowing your executioner should you do anything. The now named Aaron Black led the group of Earthrealmers to his employer. He made sure that his fellow soldiers were surrounding the group as they walked, he couldn't risk anything going wrong. There was about a minute of awkward silence before the group came upon an execution occurring. A man was propped up on a pedestal made of stone, with his hands tied to the ground. His neck was exposed over the pedestal, and it was clear they were going to decapitate him. But Aaron Black kept his constant walking pace, Kung Jin and surprisingly, Naruto, slowed their walking speed slightly. They both wanted to hear why the execution was happening. Three executioners were standing near the immobilized man. Two of them were brandishing sharp blades, while the third was reading his crimes aloud to the nearby civilian crowd. Opening his scroll, the man began to speak, this man is sentenced for the crime of theft. To gain without approval is to steal from the hand of Kotal Khan himself. This crime cannot go unpunished, therefore, the only answer is death. Finished the executioner as he closed the scroll. Please please. I only stole because I was starving. It was one loaf of bread. Pleaded the man, as tears were streaming down his face. Sentenced to death for petty theft how is that right? Yelled Kung Jin to Aaron Black's back. The cowboy, hearing this, turned around and stopped. Careful boy, you're not in Earthrealm anymore. The laws you know don't apply here, keep walking, responded Aaron Black. After a few moments of walking by the group, Kung Jin couldn't take it anymore. He split away from the group and shoved civilians aside to reach the imprisoned man. Aaron Black noticed this instantly and let out a loud whistle, a sign to bring in more warriors. Many more warriors. That idiot. He's just disregarded the mission. Said an irritated Jackwee. However, in the back of the group, nobody noticed Naruto's conflicted feelings. The shinobi in him was telling him to let the man die and continue on the mission. After all, Takeda had a point, risking war over a bread thief was stupid. But, he also understood where the man was coming from. As a young child, Naruto had to steal at times to survive because hunger was very prevalent in his childhood. The third Hokage had given him a daily allowance, but what the old man didn't know was that many merchants upcharged Naruto for everyday products. The hate for the Kaiubi was much stronger when Naruto was a child. This was how many villagers got their revenge so to speak. Because of this, items such as toothpaste, clothing, and food were often more expensive than usual for the blonde. He had nights where he was groaning from hunger in his bed and often cried from the pain. He even learned to ration incredibly small amounts of food for this very reason. As a kid, Naruto never knew when his next meal would be assured. So hearing the pleas from the crying man, Naruto was torn. He had been in that man's situation many times before and empathized with him. Before he could come to his own decision, Kung Jin had decided to act and Aaron Black let out a loud whistle. Seeing these events transpire, Naruto made his decision, he would aid Kung Jin. As he was running to the execution platform, Kung Jin knew he wouldn't make it in time. Both executioners had their blades raised and were about to deliver the fatal blow. Even if he fired an arrow, it would be too late. Shoving civilian after civilian away, he could only watch with wide eyes as both executioners brought their hands down. Crack. The sound of bone breaking was heard as two kunai impaled themselves into the chest of both executioners. The kunai had been delivered with such force that not only did it embed itself in the chest of the would-be killers, but it also snapped their sternum. 
Turning over his shoulder, Kung Jin saw a heavily breathing Naruto with his hand outstretched. It was clear, he had thrown both kunai with one hand in a split second. Nodding his thanks, Kung Jin began to deal with the final executioner and help set the man free. Having the rush of bad childhood memories had done more damage to him than he would like to admit. Taking a trip down that memory lane never had done good for him. It was also the reason he was breathing hard, childhood starvation was a feeling that never really left him. Cassie, Jackie, Takeda, and even Aaron Black were surprised at Naruto's actions. Cassie's team was more shocked at his decision to help Kung Jin, while Aaron Black was more surprised he could aim with such precision and speed at the distance he was at. It took restraint from Naruto to ensure the kunai did not cut clean through the executioners, he tried to make sure they weren't lethal blows. After all, it was hard to explain you were an ambassador to a foreign leader if you went around killing his people. Naruto immediately turned to his squadmates and let out a tired smile, sorry to get us into even more trouble team, but I couldn't let that man die. I've been where he's been before. While not supporting the actions of their shinobi squad mate, each member could understand where he was coming from. However, if one looked close enough, Cassie sported a deep frown and could only imagine the horrors the blonde never mentioned to her. Just how bad did you have it Naruto? Thought the military sergeant. The key to use this moment to try and make their teammate feel better, well don't worry about it, we would have gotten into this mess anyway, after Jin ran off. I'm just happy you didn't make his effort in vain. Naruto gave the man a smile and said a small thank you. He was glad somebody was in his corner. They then all turned to the sound of rushing footsteps. At last, the warriors that had been called by Aaron Black's whistle had arrived, plus the ones that were already here to begin with. It looked like 300 warriors had surrounded the Earthrealm team in the courtyard. The odds were definitely not in their favor. You all, handle the ones here. I'm going after Wonder Boy. Spoke Aaron Black before he ran off to Kung Jin. In the distance, among the civilian crowd, gunshots could be heard from Aaron Black's scuffle with the bow and arrow user. Stay back and let me handle the bulk of the force guys. After all, I owe it to you all, spoke Naruto before he summoned clones to take care of the warriors that arrived. While well, he could summon an entire army of clones if he wanted to, Naruto didn't want to cause even more panic than had already ensued. Showing off dominant power could scare an authority figure like Kotal Khan, and that would lead to mistrust in the future. He didn't want to make Raiden's job any harder than it needed to be. Naruto, along with his clones, only aimed to incapacitate the outworld warriors. He didn't need to go around killing Kotal Khan's men and destroy what little trust Outworld had with Earthrealm on his first official mission. This would be a little more time-consuming for him as he had to fight with the right amount of restraint so as to not kill these fighters. But no time to waste, the main Naruto jumped high and landed in the middle of the fighting. He would try to take down as many as possible without using lethal force. Instantly, 30 warriors converged upon him with 30 more ready to take their place. It would be a long fight. However, despite Naruto's quick work and his clone's help, there were still many soldiers left unattended. Seeing this, Cassie, Takeda and Jackie handled those that Naruto could not. Soon enough, they saw Kung Jin running back towards them, victorious from his battle. After launching a brutal flying kick and knocking out her opponent, Jackie turned to the man. So, how to go with Mr. Cowboy over there? Oh please, he was easy to beat once I disabled his toys, said Kung Jin. Before they could talk further, a loud rumbling could be heard and felt in the ground. Cassie and Takeda then finished off their opponent to look over at the source of this ruckus. Cassie's team, minus Naruto, all turned to see an unusual sight. The large man, nearly triple the size of Aaron Black, appeared from within a dark tunnel. He was also carrying a smaller sized girl on his upper back. Naruto also looked over after finishing his last opponent and squinted his eyes at the weird sight. Takeda looked at the large behemoth of a man and pondered, okay, what the hell is that? A large man and small girl. With the combat still occurring around the team from Naruto's clones, it was a chaotic scene overall. Grunts of pain and sounds of fists being thrown were only adding on to the battleground's intensity. The girl upon the man's back was the first to speak of the duo, Hurray. My name Farah, his name Tor. Farah then did a quick hop and shouted out, we make you no more. Prepare for destroy era. With a childlike manner of speaking, Farah then gave a quick tap on Tor's shoulder. This likely indicated the initiative in combat. After giving his roar of approval, they began sprinting at the Earthrealm team. Seeing the danger involved, Cassie switched into team captain mode. She remembered Sub-Zero's words about being a leader, and she would prove that now. After seeing that Naruto was too far away at the moment to help, she made up her mind. Jin, you stay back and provide support. Jackie, you take point. Takeda, you're with me. After giving out her orders, all three members minus Kung Jin began charging the large brute. Jackie initiated her battle by using some hooks, but Tor's strength stopped her blows with his large forearms. They absorbed the shock and he didn't even seem affected by the power. No way. Even Sub-Zero felt my hits. 
And my gauntlets are cranked up more now than they were fighting the Grandmaster. Thought a shock Jackwee. Thor, seeing his opening, grabbed the soldier and planned to snap her back upon his knee. Kung Jin, seeing this, shot an arrow straight into his wrist to avoid this happening. After grunting in pain, Tor dropped Jackwee to the ground as dust rose up from the impact. Tor ripped out the arrow and snapped it in half. Next up, Takeda arrived to deliver a fast elbow strike to Tor's midsection. Tor, not even feeling the blow, grabbed Takeda by his head and slammed him into the ground. He then followed this up with a rough stomp to his chest. Not willing to see his friend's chest cavity possibly get caved in, Kung Jin fired an arrow into Tor's left shoulder before he could deliver a second stomp. This only aggravated the brute and he snapped this arrow as well. Takeda was able to quickly roll out of the way. To help take the heat off Takeda, Cassie emerged with a sweeping leg kick that literally did not move the giant. Not one to be discouraged, Cassie shot up with a sweeping uppercut which connected to the brute's jaw. She could tell that actually did hurt Tor due to him grinding his teeth in anger, but only slightly. Feeling angered, Tor grabbed Cassie with both arms to prevent her from getting away. He held her up high above his head so Farah could finish the job. Unfortunately for her, just as Farah pulled out her metal claws, a bow flew into her leg and knocked her off the brute. Being instantly concerned for his companion, Tor threw Cassie away and allowed Farah to come back up, although with a slight limp this time. Having enough of Kung Jin's arrows, Tor rushed the Shaolin warrior. Kung Jin prepared himself. Thor swung with his left fist, but Kung Jin managed to duck the blow and swing his both into Tor's ribs. Hearing a slight hiss of pain, Tor brought both hands down to deliver a slam. Do this, Kung Jin rolled out of the way and sniped Farah off Tor's back once again, this time hitting her in the side. Thor, having enough of this, brought his partner back up, ripped out the two arrows embedded in her, and threw her at Kung Jin. She landed on the Shaolin warrior's chest and tried swiping at his face, which Kung Jin constantly dodged. You big Mimi. Me and Tor make you go bye-bye. Rahio. Stated Farah as she tried to hit the Shaolin in the face. Seeing his distracted state, Tor ran up and grabbed Kung Jin's leg. He then yanked hard, forcing the Earthrealm fighter to land on his back with a slight oof. After realizing her partner was in control of the fight now, Farah hopped off Kung Jin and onto Tor's back once again. Now that his partner was safe, Tor let loose. Letting out a primal roar, Tor raised Kung Jin by his leg and slammed him down into the ground. A back and forth, like a child throwing a tantrum with their toy, ensued. This occurred for about five seconds before Tor blinked at his hand. He now held nothing. He looked around for the man he had in his grasp seconds prior. Hung Jin coughed hard, but thankfully, there was no blood. This at least told him he didn't have any serious internal bleeding yet. Looking up from his disoriented state, he saw Naruto holding him up in a sitting position. Looking at the blonde, had to ask the question in his mind, what happened? I was getting thrown around a few seconds ago. I had to use high jonin speeds to quickly release his hand and grab you at the same time, and then I brought you here so you could recover. Seeing Kung Jin's lost look, he simplified his explanation, I traveled at a really high speed, so he couldn't register me grabbing you and leaving him a present behind. Now, you're here. True to his words, both Kung Jin and Naruto saw Tor looking around for the Shaolin fighter. They were about 60 feet away and behind the large man. Damn, he traveled that fast, that quickly. He must really be holding back now I really feel like an ass for doubting him when he first arrived, thought a humbled Kung Jin. Seeing Naruto keeping a constant watch on Tor's searching gaze, Kung Jin spoke up. Hey Naruto, seeing he got the blonde's attention, he continued, I'm sorry for treating you harshly at first. You really came through for me, especially helping me free that man earlier. Naruto then responded, don't worry about all that, it's water under the bridge. Besides, it's hard for me to keep grudges against my friends. Seeing they were considered friends now, Kung Jin gave a smile, but a violent cough interrupted them. Damn, getting thrown around like that really bruised me up. Yeah, I'm sorry about that by the way. I was so caught up in fighting I didn't notice the team getting taken down, he then looked over to his right, seeing Takeda help Cassie and Jackwe up. He then looked back at Tor, but don't worry, I'll be sure to pay him back. Leaving a clone behind to help Kung Jin, Naruto stood up and began walking to the behemoth. Kung Jin spoke up from where he was sitting, just be careful, this guy is crazy strong. He's eaten a lot of my arrows, and even Jack we couldn't really hurt him. Giving a thumbs up in response, Naruto spoke, don't worry, I can handle him. Even though Kung Jin had not known Naruto long, or even well, the words he spoke made him believe in him. After giving a small nod, Naruto began hurrying his pace to the brute. This monster has hurt my friends, and it could have gone worse if I didn't intervene when I did a mistake I won't make again Naruto, then fastened his headband and tucked in his necklace, after what he did to my team, he's gonna pay. I've been wanting to let loose in this world for a while now, and now I can. I'm about to make this fucker pay seeing Cassie get up with a pained expression really pissed Naruto off. Nobody would hurt his friends while he could help it, nobody. 
Hey, big and ugly. Shouted Naruto as he walked to the duo. Farah and Tor then turned around to see a blonde-haired man walking to them. They weren't intimidated in the slightest. Looking for my friend. Well don't worry, I got him out of here, and now it's just you and me. Said Naruto with a hard gaze. Grrrrra. You make Toy go away. Now you go away. Shouted Farah before Tor roared his agreement. The large behemoth then began charging the shinobi. Despite the obvious dangers, Naruto stood still and awaited the man. What is he doing? He's just standing there. He's leaving himself wide open. Exclaimed a worried Cassie Cage. She was standing with the support of Takeda and Jackwee. Takeda shook his head, I'm not sure, it seems unnecessarily risky. Cassie just bit her lip in worry as she saw her friend be potentially crushed. Despite the amount of stories she heard from the shinobi, she just didn't know how this would play out. Seeing was believing as they say. One thing was for sure, Jackwee, Cassie, Takeda and Kung Jin were keeping their eyes glued to the fight. This would be their first chance to see how their teammate fought. But the roar that came from deep within, Tor jumped and put all his weight, strength and power into a punch aimed at the blonde's face. He wanted to get this over with, he had been fighting for a while now. To everybody's surprise, Naruto did the most unexpected thing. He caught the punch with his open palm. Everybody stared with wide eyes, they were stunned. Tor, who threw them all around and ate Jackwee's punches, was stopped by a man less than half his size. Naruto had held his palm out to catch the punch, and it did. Even Tor was rattled by this occurrence. His mouth was slightly agape and Farah, for once, didn't have anything snarky to say. That's your best. Retorted aboard Naruto, I guess it isn't much now let me show you what happens when you hurt those close to me. Naruto then disappeared in a blur of speed and reappeared after giving a vicious uppercut into Tor's right pectoral. He dug his fist deep, twisted and pulled it out in one fluid motion. Tor fell back slightly and groaned in pain. However, the blonde wasn't even close to being done. In another blur of speed, he delivered a leg kick that snapped Tor's head to the side. It was so quick and hard that it even forced Farah to fall off his back. Tor, a man who weighed heavy enough to shake the ground, was sent flying in the air. After soaring for a few seconds, Naruto threw a kunai alongside the back of Tor's prone form and teleported to it. This was him using the Horation. After appearing behind Tor in midair, Naruto grabbed the very same kunai he teleported to and used it to slash his opponent's Achilles tendon. This was done in both of his legs in less than a second. Naruto then gave a right punch into Tor's back that sent him straight up. Again, Naruto threw his kunai and teleported above the brute. To end the combo, he gave a nasty spinning elbow into the behemoth's nose. A sickening crunch was heard, signifying it was broken. This also sent Tor flying back into the earth. When he landed, a small crater was formed due to the amount of force Naruto put into his blow. With a graceful landing, Naruto stood in front of the fallen warrior. He then sealed away his kunai and began to talk, even if you survive this fight, you now have lifelong injuries. You'll never be able to fight like you did. The Achilles tendon slash in both legs ensured his words would ring true. If Tor survived, he would be crippled for life. Tor didn't even respond, he was barely breathing. Nobody knew if he would survive or if he would succumb to his injuries. Is it bad I kinda found that hot? Asked a stunned Cassie Cage. I feel like that's a kink you got from your mother, responded Jackwee. You gross, said a disgusted Takeda. He didn't want to think of that. Hung Jin, after recovering with a limited knowledge Naruto's clone had on healing justice, stood up and thought, I am so glad I am friends with him now. Naruto then shunshine behind the downed Farah and gave a quick neck chop to knock her out. He didn't feel like dealing with her and couldn't find the heart in him to kill what he considered a kid. Afterward, he jogged to his teammates, followed closely by Kung Jin, to offer his support. Here, let me help you out. I don't specialize in healing, but I've learned enough over the years to help out with basic injuries. This will help soothe your pain and repair muscle tears. Spoke Naruto as he began to channel healing chakra in his hands. He then hovered them over Cassie's injuries as she stood. Gonna be honest with you man, that was some cool stuff, spoke Takeda, I've seen some great ninjas, but none of them can do what you can. Naruto gave a chuckle and retorted his thanks, it felt nice to be appreciated. Kung Jin then approached and began making conversation with his team. Just as Naruto finished up healing Cassie, Jackwee, and Takeda, they all turned to see his clones finish fighting the remaining forces. Not needing them anymore, Naruto poofed them out of existence just to learn that each fallen warrior was unconscious, not killed. This was a relief because it was one less problem to worry about. Soon, a large group of more warriors busted into the courtyard with a yellow-skinned lady leading. She began to speak, this one is named Dvora, she then gestured to herself, and you have all interrupted outworld matters. She scanned the group before landing her eyes upon a mutilated Tor and an unconscious Aaron Black. You are all Earthrealm residents, correct? Seeing no harm in answering her question, Cassie gave a quick nod. 
Not wanting this to be turned into something bigger, Jack we spoke, we only wish to speak to Kotal Khan, we, silence. Spoke Vora, this one is most surprised at the diplomatic way Earthrealmers treat foreign emissaries. However, Vora sensed something that made her smile. She then turned her eyes to Naruto and said, Our hive tells me you are the most powerful of the group you make a fine specimen, she then licked her lips sensually. Ah uh, thanks responded Naruto, warily and disgusted. The hive would make good use of him thought Vora. Getting back on track, Vora looked at Cassie, nonetheless, the consequence of interrupting outworld business is death if we did not follow the Riaiko Accords. But since we do, we will bring the Emperor, you all will wait here. Vora then made her leave to get Kotal Khan, while Cassie's team remained in the courtyard. Cassie then took this moment to address Kung Jin. Can you please tell me why you broke protocol during this mission and went off on your own? Said Cassie while taking a deep breath. Kung Jin then replied, because, not all thieves are beyond saving. After explaining the reasons behind his actions, each squad mate besides Naruto came to an understanding. Kung Jin once stole an important family heirloom from Raiden, only to be given a second chance by the Shaolin monks. Now, wanting to know why the shinobi would back him up, Cassie turned to Naruto. But the softer gaze, she spoke, then can you please tell me why you backed him up almost instantly Naruto. We understand you've been in that position before, but we need a further explanation. She didn't want to do this, but the military training instilled in her required her to know why a teammate would not follow orders. Naruto, seeing how he needed to fully explain his actions, closed his eyes in preparation. What I'm about to tell you isn't wonderful, but I need to explain where I was coming from. The blonde-haired shinobi then went on to explain how his childhood wasn't the best. The nights of starvation and hunger plagued him occasionally as a child. This nearly brought a tear to Jacqui's eye, and even Kung Jin was rattled by this information. Damn dude, you really had it rough thought a sat in Takeda. I really just had to go and make him reopen old wounds ha huh, thought Cassie, hating how this was the second time she did it. Before anybody could say anything, Kotal Khan arrived with his personal entourage. The emperor walked until he was a few feet in front of the group, eyeing his fallen warriors as he passed them. You required my presence, I have arrived. Speak now before I lose my temper, said Kotal Khan with authority. Cassie then explained the situation with Li Mei's village and how they sought asylum in Earthrealm. However, she focused mainly on Melina and how she had pushed back Li Mei's forces with ease. Kotal Khan then spoke after digesting the information told to him. While I did not know of this event, I do know of one thing. I did not bring any Earthrealm fighters into my empire to stop an act of justice from being carried out today, spoke Kotal Khan, referencing the man who was freed. Kotal Khan then started pacing around with his hands behind his back as he spoke, furthermore, what proof is there that you are not allied with Melina? Her strength could have earned her more allies for all I know. Naruto then thought, he's ruling out of fear, paranoia even. Everyone is out to get him in his mind unless proven otherwise the effects of a civil war. No, we're definitely not allied with Melina. Spoke Kung Jin, we're not even sure if the power she has now is connected to Shinnok's amulet or if before he could continue, Kotal Khan cut him off. Shinnok's amulet. Said Kotal Khan, the very same weapon that Earthrealm swore to protect. The item that even Raiden employed as personal wards against to prevent it ever getting loose. Shouted an enraged Kotal Khan. All this talk has only convinced me you are allied with Melina, he then turned to Dvora, carry out the justice outworld demands, execute them all. Kotal Khan then turned around and began to leave, while Dvora readied her herself. This one will spare the blonde for last, he will benefit the hive thought Dvora as she kept her eyes focused on Naruto. Feeling that the situation was now officially out of control, Naruto decided he needed to help his team. Remembering a critical piece of information that Johnny Cage had told him, he decided to put it to use now. Kotal Khan. Shouted Naruto, gaining the Emperor's attention with a look over his shoulder, I demand a trial by combat. This is to erase any accusations you have that we conspire with Melina. Turning around, Kotal Khan scoffed, and you are. I've never seen you here before. It doesn't matter who I am, just know I was sent here with Raiden's approval. I am a defender of Earthrealm. Now, fight me. Or risk having dishonor be placed upon you. Replied Naruto with his head held high. Each one of Kotal Khan's warriors, including Dvora, looked at the blue-skinned Emperor. They were awaiting his decision. Grinding his teeth in frustration and knowing he had been placed into a corner, Kotal Khan spoke, I accept. However, know this, the duel is to the death. Both fighters walked up to each other and stood a few feet away. All the people nearby gave room for the fight to happen. Pick his ass, Naruto. Thought Cassie as she closed her fist. Oh yeah, that emperor is in a world of trouble now. Thought a grinning Takeda. He's going to win easily, whispered a confident Jack Wee Briggs. I wouldn't want to fight him even on my best day, said a smiling Kung Jin. Seeing that his teammates had full faith in him with his emotion-sensing ability, Naruto smiled. It was now up to him to show their faith was not unfounded. Prepare yourself, Earthrealmer. Kotal Khan then sprinted at the shinobi. 
Naruto didn't want to make this fight drawn out, he wanted to end it quickly. Kotal needed to understand there was no time to waste, every second they delayed was another second Shinnok's amulet could be in use. Kotal Khan threw a left hook followed by a left boot kick to the chest. In both instances, Naruto blocked both attacks. He used his elbow to block the hook and caught the foot heading to his chest. After releasing the leg, he then shoved the emperor back a few feet. Stumbling back, Kotal Khan decided to change his strategy. He wants to humiliate me in front of my people. I will show him no mercy. Thought Kotal Khan as he grabbed the Mikuahutl from his back. Naruto, seeing this, grabbed two kunai from his weapons pouch and placed them both in his hands. He then added a very thin layer of wind chakra to add more power into his blows, as well as strengthening his blades. Owashita. With a quick shout and a raised hand, Kotal Khan shrouded himself in the sunlight. This would boost his attack power and heal any wounds he sustained quickly. This time, it was Naruto who charged the Emperor. With both sides settled in their own right, a clash ensued. Each time Kotal Khan would swing his Mikuahutl, Naruto would be ready to block the blow. After swinging low, Naruto was able to hop up and slash into the Emperor's right shoulder and lower torso with both kunai. After hissing in pain, Kotal drew upon his own blood and healed the wounds inflicted by Naruto. I see, he combined the power of his sunlight and has a variation of blood absorption to heal his wounds. I'll just have to hit him hard and fast so he can't take advantage of this. This thought ran through Naruto's head in about a second mid-battle, showing how seriously he had taken his training over the past three years. Not willing to let Naruto get close again, Kotal dashed backward and summoned a sunstone with his hand raised in the air. In one hand, he held his Mikuahutl, in the other, the sunstone. He then launched a disc at the ninja with great precision. Naruto, seeing this, decided the fight had gone on long enough. As the disc flew towards him, Naruto threw the kunai in his left hand high into the air and performed a front flip. In slow motion, Naruto grabbed the disc while front flipping before it could fly past him. After he landed, he spun with vicious velocity and threw the sunstone back into the emperor's face, hard. In fact, the impact was so great in shattered the sunstone into dust upon contact with the warrior's head. The impact rattled the emperor's head backward and resulted in him having a minor concussion. After stumbling around, Kotal looked at the shinobi. Feeling disoriented, Kotal was not prepared for what happened next. In a perfect display of timing, the kunai Naruto threw high into the air moments ago and landed into his waiting palm. Then, Naruto dashed at high jonin speeds to finish the fight. Kotal, still dazed from his own projectile backfiring on him, didn't see what was coming. Before he could call upon his sunlight for health, Naruto was upon him. Naruto counted the number of quick slashes he inflicted upon the emperor's body as he did them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this occurred for a total of 28 gash wounds on the Ash tech. Everybody on the sidelines were stunned at what they were seeing. This ninja had just displayed some of the finest moments in a fight they had ever seen. This guy just keeps surprising me in the way he fights. It's almost like each move is calculated and thought out. Always thinking a step ahead of his opponent wondered an amazed Kung Jin. Okay now I can see the appeal Cassie was talking about thought a surprise Jack Lee Briggs. Seeing Naruto fight up close was much more impactful than from a distance. Naruto then ended his barrage of slashes with a final cut through the Emperor's wrist, severing the tendons. This caused Kotal to drop his Mikuahutl and stumble back in surprise. He couldn't even register the amount of pain he was in because it all happened so fast. Seeing the Emperor disarmed, Naruto then stored both of his blades back into his weapons pouch, ran up to Kotal, and delivered a hard somersault kick into the Osh Tech's jaw. This caused the man to fall back, groaning in pain from his injuries. His prized Mikuahutl was lying beside him, unable to be held. Naruto then looked around him as the people staring were surprised. A majority of outworld people were floored at what they saw. Their emperor, a man who had been considered a god by some people, was flattened by a young adult from Earthrealm. This one will be sure to remember this Naruto he is most troubling indeed thought a worried Bora, no longer confident she could battle the blonde. Hodel, looking through his dazed state, spoke at the combatant looming over him. Go ahead, kill me. It is your right as trial by combat, awaiting the Shinboy's decision, everybody perked their ears. Finally, Naruto spoke, no emperor, I won't kill you. Instead of taking your life, I ask for cooperation. Let us work together to track down Melina and take the amulet back if she does have it. We don't want war with you. Naruto then gestured to the many warriors spewing around the courtyard. We did not come with the intention to kill or harm your people. In fact, if you look closely, each one of your warriors is still breathing emperor. They are unconscious, beaten, but not dead Naruto, then look towards the fallen form of Tor, however, I cannot be certain that one is still alive. He caused our group disrespect that had to be repaid. After looking around and seeing Dvora nod, indicating the blonde was speaking the truth, Kotal made his decision. Kotal, feeling defeated but honored, slowly stood up and nodded his head. 
grimacing in pain and holding his side, the Osh tech spoke, hear me. I declare the charges of conspiracy by Earthrealm to aid Melina as false. They are now void. Holding his hand out, signifying there were no harsh feelings involved, Naruto awaited to see if Kotal would reciprocate the gesture. Suffering a bruised ego is difficult for anybody, but not if the safety of your people comes first. Kotal then brought his own arm out, bloodied and sore, into grasp with the blonde. What he did not expect was his wounds to steam and heal nearly instantly. Even the headache that was forming was gone. The taste of blood in his mouth, the tendons in his wrist, all of the damage was gone. Seeing Kotal's questioning gaze, Naruto spoke, I delivered what my people call healing chakra into your system. Your wounds have been sealed and healed. Consider this gesture of good faith, further proving Earthrealm does not mean you rule any harm. Well Naruto wasn't lying, he wasn't saying the entire truth. In actuality, he sent a quick spark of Kurama's healing chakra into the Emperor when their hands connected. It wasn't much and it would burn out soon from his body, but it was enough to heal the damage inflicted. It's really hard to hate this guy. Even when he whoops your ass, you can tell he's being genuine thought Kung Jin, while shaking his head and hiding a smile. Very well, Earthrealmer. I see your point. We will aid you in finding Melina and removing the amulet from her grasp. I am in your debt. Responded Kotal, looking deep into the blonde's eyes. He could respect the power of someone, but he respected humility even more. But that being said, Cassie spoke up. It was time to take over the situation as team captain. Seeing as we have come to a new agreement I'll be sure to let General Blade know. After speaking, Cassie pulled out her phone and began typing rapidly. After a few more moments, Cassie got a hold of her mother. But Sonya, on base. After being given a quick dev freak by her daughter, Sonya spoke into her phone while walking deeper into the refugee camp she was investigating. Excellent work Sergeant Cage. Stay with Kotal Khan and see what you can find out. Tell Naruto he also has my praise, he might have just saved us from another war without world. General Loud. After putting away her cell phone, Sonya stopped her walking pace to look at the entirety of the refugee camp. She needed to track down Kano and apprehend him. General, over here. Shouted two soldiers carrying a body bag upon a stretcher. Sonya walked over, opened the bag, and began to ask us what she was seeing. We found her not too long ago in the refugee camp, General. After looking closer at the victim's neck, Sonya instantly knew what happened. It looks like she was a victim to one of Kano's necties she then zipped the bag up, keep searching for more evidence, keep your eyes peeled Sonya, then walk deeper into the camp. Feeling a slight buzz in her pocket, Sonya held up a communicator that was given to her by the Thunder God. A few moments later, Raiden appeared in holographic form with his arms crossed. What's the update Raiden? Asked Sonya. It appears Shinnok's amulet was taken without my notice. It was replaced by a duplicate. I cannot say for how long we were deceived. Fuck, just what we needed even more bad news whispered Sonya. Raiden then jerked his body to the left, as if something garnered his attention. He then turned to Sonya and said, something has taken priority. I will return when before another word could be said, Raiden disappeared from the communicator. Just great, now we lost Raiden, muttered an annoyed Sonya. She then put away the device and spoke to a nearby group of soldiers. Lieutenant, gather your best men and take a squad to Raiden's last known location. We need to ensure nothing has happened to him. Report back to me once completed, dismissed. With their orders given, a quick yes ma'am was heard before these soldiers marched away to complete their mission. Looking to her left, Sonya then saw her ex-husband walking up to her. What's the report from Colonel Flagg? Straight to business huh? After not getting a response besides a hard stare, Johnny continued, I asked him what the camp security was looking like, Johnny then crossed his arms. He then told me to things were fine and to fuck off. So then I had to spend the next 10 minutes hearing him whine about how I was the punishment he had to endure due to your orders. So, in summary, General, camp security is currently at fuck off status, does that satisfy you? Replied Johnny with a snarky finish. Not dignifying a response, Sonya waved off Johnny's comments and walked away. Johnny decided to catch and get ahead of the walking general. He then turned around to speak to his ex-wife. You can't just brush me off like you've been doing. I'm also a part of this operation. Spoke a serious Johnny Cage. Sonya, seeing she was blocked from walking forward, began to respond, and if it was up to me, you wouldn't be here at all. It wasn't my decision to include you. Johnny, finally having a built-up feeling of emotion, let it all out. And this is why we couldn't work out in the first place. You just go off, get deep into your work, and forget about the people around you. Sonya, not wanting to hear this right now, began to walk around Johnny. However, Johnny was not having it and grabbed her by the elbow, pulling her back. Unhand me cage, or I can get you in trouble for battery against a military general. Spoke Sonya. That's fine, lock me up, but you're going to hear what I have to say first. Johnny then released her elbow but kept a firm gaze. You weren't there when I needed you, and that's fine. 
But you weren't there when your daughter needed you either and that's inexcusable. Bullshit. Snapped back Sonya, tired of hearing this, I was just in her life as much as you were. Were you Sonya? Asked Johnny with a firm frown, do you remember when we split up? How young Cassie was. What does this have to do with anything? Asked Sonya, feeling frustrated. When we first split, Cassie needed a mom. She needed a woman to show her things I couldn't. She needed someone that would show her motherly affection Johnny then started getting red in the face from anger, but instead, all she got was a cold, loveless bitch for a mom. You weren't there when she had her first kiss, you weren't there when she had her first boyfriend, and you weren't even there to send her off to her high school prom. I was, not you. Johnny then pointed his finger at the general. Johnny then continued, there were nights when she was waiting for you to come to pick her up on a scheduled court visit for the weekend, and you were too busy to see her. Do you understand how that must have made her feel? Feeling like her own mom didn't want to spend time with her. Sonya, remembering these events, began to well up with tears in her eyes. She would come home and ask why all the other kids at school would have moms who would play with their children, but not her own. I damn near cried out of frustration for her Johnny, then took a deep breath to calm himself, she even saw the court documents I left out on my personal desk one night by accident, she saw that you didn't try to file for custody Sonya. That really crushed her. I had to spend all night with her just so she could go to bed that night, Sonya, letting a few tears fall out, silently wiped her eyes with the sleeves of her shirt. She never thought letting work control her would have such a nasty effect on her daughter. Johnny, seeing his ex-wife state, decided to wrap up. And you know what the worst part is? She still wants your affection, your approval. And yet, you still give her orders like she's a piece of gum on your boot. I've seen dogs get treated with more love than you give your own daughter Johnny, then finished with one last comment, if you don't want her, that's fine. She's always going to be my daughter and if you don't want to be her mother, don't act like you do. Johnny then walked off, finally getting the feelings off his chest that he held over the years. Sonya, seeing as nobody noticed her presence, walked into a nearby bathroom to freshen up. Instead, she leaned on the wall and began to cry her eyes out. It took all of her willpower to not sob loudly and instead choke them into her arm. She didn't realize she had treated her own daughter so harshly. It made her feel like complete shit, like a worthless human. The flashback popped into her head. Back when Earthrealm was still in the Netherum War. Back then, she and Johnny were nearly inseparable. They always had each other's back and cared deeply for one another. Back then, Johnny had nearly turned into a Ravenan due to Quan Kai's sorcery, but she had fought off the sorcerer long enough for Raiden to counteract his spell. This was the same incident that freed Scorpion, Sub-Zero, and Jax from Quan Kai's control. Even during her pregnancy, Johnny was always there to attend to her needs. It was only after Cassie was born that Sonya began diving back deep into her work. This would eventually lead to her separation from Johnny. As everybody conducted business as usual such as walking around the camp and investigating claims, nobody heard the highly praised general sobbing in a bathroom. She needed to come to terms with what her ex-husband said before she could go back outside. For once, her family came before her job. What if Naruto was sealed inside Mortal Kombat? Thanks for watching my video till the end if you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.